Hey everybody, welcome to We've Got Worm, a Daily Planet Films podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss the hit web serial Worm week by week, arc by arc. Our name is Matt Freeman, your hosts and self-replicating artificial intelligence collective, and we're joined, as always, by everyone's favorite hastily put together cyborg, Scott Daly. Scott, how's it going? Error. Error. Critical failure. Rebooting. Podcast hosts. Version 3. Error. Program titled Charm Version 1.2 has failed to load. Error. Program titled Humor Version 7.5 has failed to load. Error. Data file Basic Axe Terminology and Uses has failed to load. Error. Subroutine Being Fair to Taylor Version 1.0 has failed to load. Hello. 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 Hello, Matt. I'm back. Ah, oh, yeah, good to see you loaded. Finally, <laughs> took took a little while. Um, yeah, I'm 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 back. And and as you said, this is the podcast where you, a worm expert, guide me, a first time reader through Wild Boat's world of superheroes, supervillains, and everything in between, as I inspect, interpret, and even speculate on what the story is and where it is going. This week, I'm back in the country, and we're tackling part one of Arc 16, Monarch, which covers chapter 16.1 through 16. Y, which is the second of two bonus interludes in this section. Um, after two weeks off for me, but almost zero time off for everyone else, um, I'm back and I don't remember how to podcast. So uh, let's see how this goes. Yeah, I'm, you, everyone missed uh, me messing with my microphone <laughs> for five minutes just now. So um, <laughs> too bad. Uh, yeah, I, well, you know what? It's going to be entertaining for everyone either way. Yeah, yeah, it will. Um, this first half of Arc 16 finds our protagonist and her team in another uh, frying pan fire situation as dragon suits mobilize all at once in an attempt to take back the city from the bad guys. Um, Matt, I'm, I'm pretty mixed about this one. Uh, there's, there's a lot to like, but there's a lot that I'm not a huge fan of. Yeah, I, I think right off the bat, we can address some things, um, uh, you know, it, cause it's, so it's not a surprise, I think when, when we get into it, um. And I think you and I largely agree on kind of the main thing. So, so, so I'm just going to bring it up up front, uh, which is that it, at least I specifically feel that that the main problem with this half arc is is a basic lack of stakes. In that uh, we don't, we as the readers don't care a ton about Dinah in the first place, and we also don't believe that Coyle is going to follow through on his promise just because it seems really disingenuous and Taylor seems really gullible. Um, so the whole like defeat dragon in order to save Dinah, like it doesn't connect. It kind of, it kind of rings hollow. Um, all, all of that said, there's a lot, there's always a lot of meat on the bones. Um, even if the bones don't form a terribly compelling structure. So basically we're looking at a very meaty mutant dog with bony deformed skeleton underneath it. It's belly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, um, I, I pretty much agree with you. I, I, th I care a little bit more about Dinah than you do, I think. Um, <laughs> but I, I think there's just there's just a certain level of, of clunkiness to some of the, the main big action set pieces in this one. Um, and it, I, we'll, we'll get into this in detail, but uh, there is there is you're absolutely right. So much good here still. Um, every time we critique something, I feel like. Even if we have one bad thing to say, we have like 20 good things to say. So um, we'll, we'll get into all that. But let's let's dive straight in, because this is a really long arc. This is the longest arc in the book. We've divided it in half, but still we have so much to talk about that we're definitely going to run out of time. So let's just get into the episode and get yeah. to it. Well, well, we'll get there in, in a gif, Scott. Uh, but first, some words on the Reddit discussion, uh, because there seemed to be this idea voiced by a few people. There were there were a few distinct comment threads. Um, about how Scott is has this impervious deontological moral sense, uh, and 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 this is a podcast about Scott versus Taylor, the consequentialist hero, and I wanted to kind of address that, and and say my take on it. Um, I, I don't think what Scott is doing is imposing a deontological worldview on things. I think that he and I in a different way, are just kind of refusing to put up with Taylor's bullshit, self-justifying, fake consequentialism that conveniently always lets her give in to her worst instincts and escalate conflicts and see everybody else as a bullying aggressor and lie to everyone all the time and fail to think things through properly. Um, 
speaking personally, I've even found that trying to live by consequentialism is pretty much a disaster because unless you're perfectly fair at all times, you'll just automatically put more utility or more ethical weight on the outcomes that you wanted anyway. So consequentialism in normal life just becomes a great way of dressing up a bad habit of doing whatever you feel like uh, with pretty ethical justifications. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And it, you know, when I saw people call me out as as deontological, I was a little bit surprised. I, I don't. I, I guess you you would say that I lean that way. If there's a scale between deontological and and consequential, um, I definitely lean more towards that way. And I think my my moral code is a tad more rigid rigid than most people. But I'm also kind of a realist and aware that trolley problem esque situations exist and there's going to be a time when you have to choose a situation that possibly hurts the least amount of people. But as you said, I, I don't believe Taylor has actually come across that many of those situations. I think she bends parameters and builds a narrative to make her, her moral dilemmas appear to be trolley problems so that she doesn't feel bad or or is able to do a thing that she maybe wanted to do in the first place. Um, you, you could turn like last week's mayor incident into a trolley problem if you really wanted to. Um, you could say very simply that the choice here is um, hurt the mayor's son or everyone else in Brockton Bay gets hurt. Um, but I think that line of thinking is an ignoring like 5,000 other parameters that are in place. Um, this is not a simple one or the other. Um, and I don't think Taylor was really choosing between two bad outcomes here. She was choosing one bad outcome and then shifting that narrative to make it seem like it was the least bad option and for all the right reasons. Um, fun fact, did anyone ever like ask the mayor which way he was leaning in this argument? Like, did, <laughs> did anyone ask that question at all? Yeah, I, I don't believe so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, and, I, think, and, I think Taylor's I think she's more motivated by guilt than by actually like the greater good in that moment. And, and that's that's the main thing that I that I want to emphasize. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that's a, a common theme we'll see in this uh, this half of the arc, too, is a lot of a lot of guilt is around uh, some of our characters and and how it motivates them or how it is present but fails to motivate them. But I think with a few exceptions, this part is probably going to be the last time we really tackle morality in this episode. Um, there's a few brief moments where we get into it here and there, but the first half of arc 16 doesn't delve deeply into moral quandaries of our team's decision. It's kind of just a lot of action, a lot of got to get this done, got to get to a certain spot, and then we'll deal with all that stuff later. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, uh, that all makes sense to me. Yeah, before we move on, though, I, I, I really have a really important thing to ask you, Matt, something that's been nagging at me since I listened to last week's episode whilst training uh, through the beautiful Norwegian countryside. Um, Matt, did you did you pronounce GIF as a GIF last week? I, um, what's a GIF? <laughs> you disgust me. <laughs> All right. And with that, uh, let's get into the episode. 16.1 opens with Taylor throwing a party for the people in her territory, although she herself is miserable about the situation with Dinah and with her dad and just kind of in general. Uh, it does, however, seem like she will have accomplished all her objectives before the three-day deadline that Coyle gave last time. Yeah, it's those kind of uh, overachievers that really screw up the curve for the rest of us, huh? Yeah. I I'm, I'm glad to see Taylor having guilt here. Um, I think guilt can be good at times and can spur you to some amount of change. Um, I, 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 like we were talking about, I think most of Taylor's problems stem from the fact that uh, her guilt is usually misplaced. Either she blames herself for things that are not her fault, or she isn't blaming herself for things that are her fault. Um, so <laughs> I, I think that's that's a common thread we're going to see in some of the moments here. I, I do really like seeing Taylor take pride in something that she's done well, though. Um, this is not something we see in her very often, and she's letting her people celebrate and because she's proud of their accomplishments, she's proud of her accomplishments. And as much as I don't like this authoritarian power grab that the undersiders have gone under, um, it's hard to argue with the results of it. Um, she's made at least a portion of these people's lives better. And this this really does serve as, as some setup for a later conversation in the coming chapters. Um, Taylor is proud of her success. And then we're going to see uh, Director Pigot specifically attack that pride and that success in a bit. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I just wanted to draw out this beat here where uh, it was a bit disconcerting to see how the crowd parted to give me a path. In my first night out in costume, I'd seen the ABB do it for Lung. 
how much of that was respect and how much was fear. Maybe they weren't so distinct when it came to supervillains. Yeah, um, this is a, a beat where Taylor uh, compares herself to Lung, and it's going to be something that continues a little bit later. So I think it's good to point it out um, because I, I think we're seeing some full circle miss happening in this episode, um, and I think that's important. Yeah, totally. So then uh, Gru shows up in her territory in costume, and she walks over to talk to him. Um, he definitely noticed that she didn't call him after the terrorize the mayor mission was over. Uh, and he's also the first one to bring up the relationship topic. Um, Taylor ends up inviting him to come over to her lair after the party and hang out. Yeah, the, the power balance in this relationship seems pretty skewed, doesn't it? Um, and I think we'll see that how that plays out um, in a few chapters. But any time that Brian and Taylor are talking about their relationship, I can't help but feel awkward because they're just so awkward around each other. And I think Wild Bill once asked us if Taylor felt like a teenager. Um, Brian and Taylor both never feel more teenagery to me than they do in these moments when they're trying to stumble through having a relationship. Um, this, un this complete unsure of what they're supposed to do, of their feelings, um, stumbling through the correct way to talk to each other, like cringeworthy attempts to flirt with each other. Um, like yeah. when he says, in the spirit of saying what's on my mind, I'm kind of wondering how your people would react if I kissed you right now. Like that's so cheesy and kind of terrible. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know. It's just like, I think it's supposed to be that way. I, I, like there's, there's a lot to their relationship that isn't good um and i think we're seeing just how they stumble through it yeah it, it's very authentic to my first teenage supervillain relationships that, oh, that's what's my experiences yeah, of yeah. Course. um yeah so as they're talking they come to a, a, a tentative agreement that the job will come first and they'll fit each other in between the cracks yeah uh, funnily enough i tried to talk to my wife about the same arrangement with uh, the daily planet and her and uh, she she laughed at me <laughs> um the point is uh, it, it's not a kind of arrangement that's tenable to the success of a relationship um it reminds me of that episode of west wing where leo mcgarry uh, the president's chief of staff tells his wife that uh, his job is more important than his marriage um and, and he had a point in that episode. He's working for the president of the United States. Um, and unlike Leo Taylor and Brian are what they're trying to do. It's an important thing. It's really important. And if they're going to survive, it might be more important than their budding relationship. Um, but Leo's marriage ended after that fight with his wife. And I suspect that's where Taylor and Brian are heading to. All right. Uh, well, anyway, before Gru can leave, um, Skitter senses a vibration through her bugs and detects that one of Dragon's suits is perched nearby, covering an entire rooftop. They get a call from Tattletail and realize that Dragon is also where she is in a different suit. And then Dragon kills the cell network. Yeah, this kind of threw me off, and I think is like the first sign that Arc 16 is not going to follow a lot of our usual worm trends thus far. Because um, we've talked about over and over again how normally the first chapter serves as a largely setup and our inciting incident for the conflict in the chapter normally is at the end of the chapter and like is set up as kind of a cliffhanger moving into the second chapter. We're not even midway through the first chapter and like, bam, we're in conflict. Conflict is incited. Dragon is here. Tension is ramped. Uh, let's do this. Uh, but, but Matt, is, is tension ramped? Uh, more, more on that later. Yeah, right. I don't I mean, that's my feeling about this is is that you're just kind of uh, I think I think like you said, it's breaking the pattern. It's catching you off balance a little bit. And you also I don't know, you kind of know the dragon isn't going to try to kill them. So it's certainly a de-escalation de in terms of having just fought the nine. Um, right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. W one more thing I wanted to specifically pull out here is is another very small beat um, as Dragon lands, Taylor notes that that she lands very close to the rooftop that Taylor originally fought Lung on. Um, couple this with the the quote that you highlighted earlier, where Taylor was comparing um, how people parted ways for her like they did for Lung. Um, these are very intentional callbacks, very, very meant to set something up. We're being reminded how far Taylor has come from those humble beginnings and how she's almost on the opposite side of things now. Uh, the title of this arc is Monarch, and I've given Taylor the moniker Queen Bee a couple times before, kind of as a joke, but I think we are specifically setting up Taylor's kind of ascendancy here, um, and, and these beats are, are setting off us up for that. Yeah, I, I love this observation that Dragon is looking down on her from a rooftop, th the same as how she first looked down on, on Lung from a rooftop. That's, yeah. that, that's yeah. not something I noticed, and I love that. So yeah, the, the mech in Skidder's territory unleashes a swarm of beach ball-sized drones that electrocute and kill bugs en masse. 
Uh, and Taylor thinks, was this what my enemies experienced? A vague feeling of dread as an unreachable opponent master forces? <laughs> I'm glad you pulled that quote out because uh, the answer, Taylor, is yes. <laughs> Absolutely yes. That's probably how people feel every time they see her swarms of bugs. Yeah, I, I agree. Especially the ones with pepper spray on them. <laughs> yeah. Four heroes. So a drone chases them down and shocks the two of them despite Taylor's attempt to stab it, but the spider silk costumes keep them relatively insulated and unharmed. As they run through Gru's darkness, they realize that the darkness itself seems to cut the drones off from Dragon's signal. But Dragon has an answer for that, firing a blast of wind that dissipates the darkness. It seems the Dragon had, has prepared specifically for countering the Undersider's powers. Yeah, and we see another beat where Taylor complains about how much she hates Tinkers. Again, we've seen this a few times before. Um, but they have this ability to pinpoint weaknesses and power sets, adapt to them, and counter them. Uh, you know, all those things that Taylor is also really good at doing. Um, I wonder how many of Taylor's enemies run around saying, Skitter, fucking Skitter, hate Skitter. Um, yeah, totally. I, I, I love that beat. It's great. Yeah, you're right that, that her, her hatred for Tinkers has been growing for some time, actually. But but it's been more subtle. I think at this point, she's she's just railing specifically at the very idea of tinkers yeah um which uh it's kind of full-fledged now so yeah they make it back uh, to coil's base and they find most of the team there except for ballistic genesis and rachel uh tattletale relates that there are seven dragon suits in brockton bay and they're all wildly different from each other yeah, and again, to talk about your stakes comment, it feels like we're supposed to be like super intimidated by this fact that like oh, there are seven suits in Brockton Bay. Um, this is Dragon Times Seven, um, but it it never really feels that way. It never feels like oh my god, this is big. Um, but but I love I do love Taylor's reaction to this though because she's basically like oh ballistic sucks, I don't care. Genesis, eh. Rachel though, oh my god. Oh my god, yeah. we have to do something. Um, that's, right. It's great. And, yeah. I, and I, Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, it's it's really hard for me to rewind into the mindset I was in the first time I read this, but I, I suspect that I was just like, well, you know, I'm sure they'll get out of this somehow, <laughs> uh, which is not a good thought to be having, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. I, I do enjoy Coil in this a lot, too, though, because he's just kind of his dicky self. Um, like, we, like the, the scene's trying to set up this huge stakes of this moment where there's seven dragon suits, and Coil's response to this is, this is not ideal. Yeah. He's, he's great. He's a great supervillain. Love Coil. Um, yeah, so, right, he, he makes it clear that he expects his cape teams to handle the situation. Uh, and Regent and Imp kind of push back, since it seems like the odds of getting captured are going to be pretty high. Uh, the Undersider's decision uh, regarding whether they're going to participate or not comes down to Taylor, and she chooses to focus in her argumentation more on the difficulty of not just defeating Dragon, but of defeating her within the required very short time frame that Coil has set. Um, so she tells him that they'll do it, and they'll do it within the time frame, but only if he promises to let Dinah go in front of everyone. Um, and and while they're doing all this, I think it's you know kind of funny that everybody's making these comments like, uh, this is above and beyond the Call of Duty when they just collectively face down the nine. Yeah, I think that's a really valid point. And to connect to everything we've talked about so far, um, I think that's one of the problems with the arc as a whole. You know, Dragon's attack does not feel like an escalation of stakes as compared to that stuff. But the story wants it to be. Um, and I think that's really important for this passage, too, because the, the idea that, oh, my God, this is the most crazy, difficult, insane thing that you've been asked, you've asked us to do is how Taylor uh, motivate and moves things to convince Coil to let Dinah go. Although, again, just like with the first promise, this is bullshit. Like, I, I didn't believe that for a second. I believed it less than the first time he promised to think about it. Um, so um, but I, the thing I really like about this is anytime you see Coil reacting in any scenario, you have to think that he's using his power. Um, so he creates a reality in which he doesn't promise this to Taylor and one in which he does. And then he picks the one that benefits him the most. Um, so I, I just enjoy that, like, in the back of your head always is, is Coil doing this. It doesn't even need to explicitly call it out. You just kind of know it's there. Yeah, that, that is a fun element. So, yeah, Tattletail heads into the base to gorge on stolen PRT data and the rest of the team heads out to face the Dragonflight. Yeah, and uh, Taylor, fully aware that Coil made the promise far too easily, she even... Uh, uh, she even points it out, but uh, she's still latching on to that, that small shred of hope. Yep. So we move into 16.2, and uh, Gru hesitates when Trickster asks if he's taking point, and Skitter just can't stop herself from volunteering, uh, even though she doesn't really have a plan, but she does have what she refers to as a strategy, 
And all we know at this point is that imp is an important part of the plan. Yeah, it is interesting how much Taylor claims that she doesn't want to lead, even though she's A, completely and totally suited to it, and B, continually can't help herself from doing it in any, any, any situation. Yeah, and, and here she is uh, thinking to herself, I was studying the group, assessing the tools we had at our disposal, which is, which is literally Taylor's toolbox uh, as applied to the people in the room. Yeah, I'm, re- um, I'm really glad that that uh, I forget who originally gave us the term, but I like it so much. I think we use it every episode now. Um, yeah, it's just yeah. a very, very quick way of, of referring to this this really complicated thing she does. Yeah. And she's always she's always done it. And I, I agree because I was always like, yeah, her, her mentality is so like problem solving oriented consistently that it's great to have a shorthand for it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Taylor points out that they should take the heroes out of the picture first because it will be impossible to fight both the city's heroes and the dragon suits. So Imp is going to infiltrate the Protectorate base, and then they'll use Shatterbird to blow out all the cameras. As usual, we we the readers go into the situation with like 10% of the plan explained to us, and we have to piece together what is what the actual plan it was uh, as we wade into the action. Yeah, are, are you complaining about that type of structure or, or merely pointing it out? Because um, I'm I, just curious. Yeah, I'm I'm really pointing it out. I actually like it as a technique. It's it's very effective in framing a situation clearly while still maintaining the tension as you go into it. Um this this section here actually had some of the most successful tension in the arc, I think, um, maybe partly because they're actually fighting the heroes who we care about and kind of feel bad for, rather than just fighting kind of these soulless AI suits. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um and I think we'll get into um some of the ways in which the plan is doled out to us in clever, fun, and what makes sense in story, um, anti-Lostian ways in which people <laughs> know things. Um, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, so they reach the PRT HQ and find dragon, a dragon suit sporting a giant electrified wheel. Are, are there pictures of these suits available? Like, have people done fan art? Because for some reason, with a lot of these suits, I just have a really hard time visualing it. I know, I think Wild Boat does a really good job of explaining it, but my brain just can't wrap my head around some of this stuff i i'm not aware of a lot of dragon mech pictures myself um but but i, I we should look for that um yeah, yeah listeners know. if you if you know about it uh send them send them our way yeah i usually just envision kind of like a generic like transformers shaped thing with a with whatever the special attribute of the suit is attached to it that's fair um yeah, so Skitter's scouting the building with bugs, and we get an unusually detailed description of the disgusting bug infestation, which doesn't seem to bother Taylor at all, as usual. Uh, she finds all the wards and some of the grown-ups, but no sign of Genesis, Rachel, and Ballistic. Matt, ever since I started reading this book, um, I just sit in any room I'm in, imagining all the bugs that are in there <laughs> with me, too. Um, Worm has made me scared of the entire world. Um, also, I like in this moment that that Taylor is just casually dropping maggots on people <laughs> so she can track them. Just like, I'm eh, just going to put a maggot on you. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. yeah. It's funny because we've avoided maggots up until now, mostly. So this is, uh, it, it's effective. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So there's this, there's this section where I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to read most of it actually, because it's all very relevant in terms of Taylor's character, but, uh, yeah, I'll just read it and then I'll comment. So, uh, we had two big guns. If we were willing to be monsters to go all out, it would be fairly a, a fairly simple matter to hit them with Shatterbird to slow them down, use Sundancer's sun set at maximum power, tell, tear the building apart, and incinerate the residents before everyone could clear out. It wouldn't even be hard. What was the point if it went that far? I was in this to save Dinah. It didn't do any good if I, was, if I ruined the lives of hundreds of Dinahs in the process, the daughters and sisters of the employees here, fathers, mothers, and the other people who did nothing... Uh, who did nothing to get caught up in this war. And um, it's at least noteworthy that she has the thought of like, we could just kill everyone, but uh, yeah. no, no, I'm not going to. Yeah. Th- th- I think this is, this says something for sure, because like it- it's, it's easy in, in a first person type of perspective to think that maybe um, this is wild Bo talking to us, the audience and telling us, Oh, yeah, by the way, I fully am aware that this thing could happen, but that's not what I'm wanting to do with the story. But when you're in a first person perspective, that's not really what's happening. Um, This isn't a narrator saying something to us. We're not simply being reminded of something. Um, 
this feels to me more than anything that of Taylor trying to convince herself of something. Um, she sees the most obvious plan of attack, but uh, then very explicitly talks herself out of it in order per- to proceed with with the plan as is. I, and I think that's important. Yeah, totally. I agree. Um, it's uh, it's a little creepy seeing her think this way, actually. Yeah. Yeah, so that they do use Sundancer's orb, but uh, they just use it to grab everyone's attention. And then when all the heroes come over to the window, Trickster swaps Skitter into the building uh, with Clock Locker, it turns out later. And she instantly blinds everyone in the room with capsaicin bugs. And uh, and uh, regarding poor poor Vista, um, so, so first of all, let's just call back to, uh, I was in this to save Dinah. Without really thinking about it, I struck her in the most vulnerable area I could reach, across the bridge of her nose, swatting her in the ear with a stroke in the opposite direction. I was in this to save Dinah. Without really thinking about it, I struck her in the most vulnerable area I could, across the bridge of her nose. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. <laughs> I struck her in the most vulnerable area I could reach. So. <laughs> I beat the shit out of her. Yeah, right. So so she just beats the crap out of poor Vista like with her baton and this is following up like like mere paragraphs maybe I don't remember a very short amount of space after just thinking like the point of this is to save this poor 13ish year old girl approximately um and then she beats up a 13 year old girl so anyway yeah wanted to point that out <laughs> yeah and it's so like she doesn't hesitate so like a chapter ago she went too far and almost killed triumph um and she was very conscious of that and felt very bad about it so much so that she temporarily abandoned her skidda persona um became taylor again and went and talked to her dad um but she's doing it again here she spe- we specifically see her say that she's got bugs crawling through everyone's airways um and like the f- like and i'm not saying she's going as hard on them as she did Um, triumph she's not but the fact that it it doesn't cross her mind um is it's kind of weird to me and especially i love the fact that it's vista here and 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 not only how that ties back to dinah but just we've we we've been these guys head and we've been through the sentinel interlude and we've seen everything that's happened since and if wildbo wanted us to be completely on taylor's side in this moment he would have made the wards he would not have made the wards so goddamn likable like every one of these characters is so likable especially poor vista who we know is like perpetually going through all this terrible stuff um and and for her to get beaten down like this it's important and i think we're supposed to see that juxtaposition yeah, poor Vista, who has a scar she's self-conscious about now, has, like, a broken nose in all likelihood. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, as as this is happening, um, the, the, plan, the plan doesn't go smoothly because Miss Militia gets wise to what's going on pretty fast, and she orders the windows blocked so Trickster can't swap Gru into the building anymore. So this um, confused me. <laughs> so, first of all, what are they blocking the window with? Um, from what I can tell, there's just they just line up and stand in front of the window so Trickster can't see Skitter anymore, right? That's, I, that I was my understanding I, of it. I, so, so, so that wasn't my understanding, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not at all confident in mine. I thought it was like they, they just blocked it with something, and Taylor doesn't like see what they did, so we don't get a description of it. But that's that doesn't make sense either because she should sort of be aware of everything that's happening in the yeah. room because yeah. of her bugs. So. They, they later say there's a screen that she cuts through. Um, but there's never a moment where we see the screen pulled down, just that the hurt, damaged uh, protectorate are backing up against the side of the window. And I'm not sure, like, so they can't swap Skitter out, but because he can't see her. But can't they swap Gruen? If it's just guys standing up against a window, can't they swap Gruen for one of them? I just, I, I don't. It, this is really unclear to me, and I had, I had a lot of trouble with all of this. Yeah, I'm and maybe sure. I'm just not reading well. I don't know. Yeah, well, I, I didn't I didn't really scan it sufficiently well that I can be like, well, let me explain it to you. So I I, uh, I think it might just be a little bit unclear. I bet someone um, in the th- Reddit thread will do that for us, though. So yes, if, someone, if someone if under- someone has a better understanding of this, please let me know. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Skitter has nonetheless already incapacitated most of the heroes. And then she cites her target, Pigot. Uh, and she describes her. She was an obese woman, 250 pounds at a minimum, with an unflattering old-fashioned haircut that might have looked good on a model with the right clothes to go with it. 
He's up there, Tay Tay. Yeah, yeah, we haven't really talked recently about Taylor's love of um, using her descriptions of people to make it very clear how she feels about them from the drop. Um, but here it is again. Uh, she does not like Pigo, and we get that very clearly. Um, and, and I think, given what we learn about Pigo in the, the interlude that's coming up next chapter, this comes off as even more mean. Of course, Taylor had no way of knowing, but um, it's just interesting. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, it, I think that the contrast there between what Taylor thinks of her and kind of more to the truth of her is very telling. Yeah, so um, apparently they've assigned Taylor a Thinker 1 classification. Congratulations, Taylor. Uh, Pigo, uh, in, in this moment, misinterprets her bug senses as prescience. Let's play the EverQuest ding noise right here. right and if you didn't hear anything it means i couldn't find it <laughs> yep and and sorry um yeah so even as she's conversing with pigot she's drawing a swarm around herself and using it to talk uh, so she kind of disappears into it and as taylor verbally spars with pigot it's once again clear that taylor has drunk the kool-aid uh, she now really thinks that the protectorate sucks and the coil led teenage parahuman gangs deserve to be in charge because they're giving the people what they need yeah and look like she is doing good for her people. Um, she is, but I really like Pigot's point here, um, where she says, don't act stupider than you are skitters. The city can't step in to help the people in your territories because we can't trust you. Also, because like you specifically said, um, you and only you were in charge and would and did attack anyone else that comes into your territory. Um, a decision was made by Coyle, by Taylor, by the undersiders to, step up and do the things that the city was failing to do. But that decision by itself also disallowed the city from doing those very things as well. So it's like a catch 22. The protectorate will never live up to the expectations that they're being placed on it. And look, the protectorate are not perfect. They have their flaws. They have bad people working for them. They are a giant front for a shady third party whose entire motivation is still unclear. Um, but so is Taylor. Yeah. In fact, Taylor is a part of, an organization which is a part of that same giant front right we, we, <laughs> yeah. we, found, we found out <laughs> yeah yeah um but pigot is the mvp of this half of the arc for me like i love this scene i love the scene with her later i love her and her interlude um it's really great and i've grown to appreciate her as a character so much more through all this and she, she yeah. fascinates me absolutely and we'll, we'll get into that later but it's great yeah yeah we'll get there um yeah so taylor cuts her way through a screen to the outside and dives through and then trickster swaps her with somebody and then she dives through a different screen and then does it again uh so basically they're, they're like throwing heroes out the window while taylor just keeps getting swapped back into the room yeah this is really cool <laughs> i think it's a really clever beat it also confirms that trickster can still see the heroes so if there's something blocking the window um he, I, I don't i don't know anyway um i am curious about something though how uh -huh. high up are they in the building right now like are they just are they just like killing people because uh, not all these people can fly uh, uh, no scott i'm sure trickster was very carefully checking to only do this <laughs> to durable or or flight capable capes i'm sure he wasn't just grabbing i'm sure vista for example didn't just get thrown out the window <laughs> yeah i'm sure, I'm sure yeah. you're yeah, I'm, you're right you're absolutely right yeah, that that couldn't happen. He's yeah. known um, he's known for his cool headed thinking and yeah. concern for others. Yeah, empathy, right? Yeah. So so at a certain point, um, she signals for Trickster to pull her outside, and uh, she sees Clock Blocker, uh, who's been clock blocked by Gru, who was borrowing his power, and then she ties him up with webs for good measure. Man, what's worse than getting fucked over by your own power? That's yeah. that's a bummer. <laughs> yeah, he's probably never experienced it before, though. Yeah, yes. uh, it's probably very interesting. Yeah. So uh, Gru and Shatterbird are duking it out with the dragon suit, uh, with Trickster and Sundance for trying to keep Gru out of its grasp. Uh, a dragon suit reinforcement arrives, uh, which is, Taylor thinks, the suit that fought Leviathan. Um, and uh, Skitter asks Trickster to put a knife to Kidwin's throat, which causes the suits to back down. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. It's a good gamble, um, though. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not, I, in that moment, I wasn't clear on whether she was asking him to do that or whether he interpreted what she was saying as put a knife to his throat. But either way, it seems to be what she wanted. I mean, she yeah. handed him the knife. It's her oh, knife. Yeah. So that's correct. Yes, you're right. Yeah. So Trickster almost gets snagged by containment foam. Like he, he does. Uh, but of course, that just results in swapping with Kid Win and Miss Militia. Um, so they end up stuck in the containment foam. 
Uh, and then the dragon suit stands down for an unknown reason, and they all make an escape. Yeah, the key to all of this plan, of course, was Trickster and his amazing and so annoying power. Um, I'm so happy that this guy's on uh, our team side currently. <laughs> um, and it, we've got to see him from the perspective of the wards. And he's so annoying. And I'm really curious if it comes down to an Undersiders Travelers fight, which which I think we're being kind of set up to happen. How exactly Taylor handles his power? Um, I'm I'm a, like I want to see how Taylor's toolbox solves the problem of Trickster's annoyingness. Yeah, I mean it is cool that the the travelers are being repeatedly set up as being super strong. So yeah, yeah. So at at this point, tied in her hair, Taylor finds a reminder that they need to go to the south end of the main beach, uh, and they head there and they find Imp. So that here we note that the fact that Imp tied the note in Taylor's hair basically made her forget the very existence of the note, which Taylor her Taylor herself presumably wrote. So not only did did she forget that Imp put it in her hair, but she forgot that it existed in the first place, basically. Yeah, and I'm not sure if this is just an aspect of Imp's powers that we haven't seen yet, or if she's just growing in power. Um, either way, I just I love Imp and her implication in everything. Um, this this gets back to what you mentioned before about how uh, we never know the entire plan beforehand and we get to see it revealed to us. Um, one one of the, the problems with that sometimes is that our point of view characters conveniently just don't think about the next phase in the plan um, until it's actually happening, um, thus not revealing it to the audience until it's proper dramatic time. But Imp's power is like a structural counter to the dilemma of how do you do that naturally without making it seem weird and, and once again, Lostian. Um, and I think Imp is just a perfect solution to that. It's because Taylor wasn't thinking about capture Pago portion of the plan and Imp's role in it was because she literally couldn't remember that it, it was happening. Um, it's not a cheat or a trick or a contrivance. It's an in-world explanation for like a regular narrative problem. And I really like it. Yeah, that's really funny that uh, I didn't make the tie to to like this being a solution to your chronic issue with with uh, hiding information from the from the uh, reader and to, to get a cheap dramatic effect. But uh, it's it's like uh, Imp was made for you, Scott. Yeah, <laughs> almost. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, Imp, Imp has with her their hostage to go. Yeah, and I guess so Pigo had an emergency kill switch. Um, which would cause all the, that's why all, all dragon suits went down um, and imp ordered her to use it, which she complied with for a reason. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> the reason why do you know? I mean, I guess it's implied that she just wanted to like, like see the, the undersiders and like measure them as people. Um, so she kind of let herself get captured, but I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I guess I could kind of make a case for like, she she already she already does know that she's probably going to get out of the situation fine um and yeah it depends on how like confident you really think she is because there's there's like one level where she's she's acting really confident in the following scenes but we can't ever know how much of that is genuine like for all she knows they're just going to like cut her throat i mean she she doesn't know they're not going to cut her throat. She just strongly suspects it. So I, I don't know. Yeah. And that's that's kind of what I mean when I talk about clunkiness. Is It's not that there's a lot of good stuff in these two chapters and, and the rest of these chapters as well. But a lot of the motivations for some of these things are just really unclear to me. And I'd happily take responsibility for that if I'm just not re reading well enough. But I, I, I find things in the story usually very clear and very easy to understand. So when it's not, it jumps out at me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think right. we'll cover that more uh, the further we go in. But first, we have to stop off for a quick chapter of of Mastercraft writing in the middle of That's us right. complaining about things. Let's jump into yeah. a wonderful chapter. Yeah, it's about time for one of my favorite interludes in the story. I think so. This is sixteen uh, dot x prt squad interlude, as as I guess we'll call it. Um, another of my favorites. Uh, so, can I be Scott for a minute? Sure. Uh, I love this intro sequence. Uh, the chopper arriving in a cloud of dust and debris, the reveal of the heavy armament being carried and the fact that it's one chopper out of several, uh, leaning on dialogue rather than description, letting us know the who, letting the tension leak in through their interactions before gradually building to the where and the what. Uh, it's just it's just beautiful. I agree completely. And I love 
that you love it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I think one of the reasons why I'm pretty down on the, the rest of this section um, is that just this chapter is so good. And it's a lot easier to make comparisons and weigh things against each other when they're just like right next to each other. Um, mm-hmm. So when you have like the gold standard of Wild Bo's writing sitting right here in the middle of your arc, um, it's just it's just it's easy to make that comparison um and combine that with the fact that i've been waiting to see perspectives of the world from the on the ground normal grunts in the thick of everything and you have my favorite interlude so far um i love it so much so let's talk about it yeah awesome yeah so we're mostly following evan the captain of squad two uh but it's a looser pov than usual i would say uh so we don't fully know who to attach to we don't know who exactly to worry about and so i think the consequence of that is that we kind of worry about this whole squad yeah i agree and there's something very uh aliens-esque to a lot of this interlude um we've got a team of gruff well-trained prt soldiers we get to see their camaraderie we get to see how they work as a team and then we see them put in a situation where they are hilariously outmatched by their opponent um in fact if you add the alien motion tracker sound to your head as you read a lot of this section it just makes everything all the more cooler yeah i uh i i went and watched aliens last night specifically because we were talking about this earlier <laughs> um yeah uh so i don't know if we specifically called it out uh, but another of wild Bo's powers is intros uh in, in in the sense that he he takes a new character that you've never met before uh and you care about them within like one page Matt, I think we call that thing out like every single episode. Yeah, well, we don't we don't always call it a power. <laughs> OK, fair. But yes, you're right. We do. We do. Mention <laughs> that. Yeah. So, yeah, as the PRT squad moves into the little town of Ellisburg, population 5000, there's nothing but rain and darkness and silence. Uh, they know that they're going up against the high level changer, but they don't know much about his powers. And we just get this little bit of flavor. Um Formation is number one priority. Trust nothing and nobody. Passwords. Hit hard. Obliterate. And pray, Lady asked. This this is the kind of dialogue that just causes me to nerd out so much. It's such a minor, little, tiny moment, but it does so much. Uh, we define Lady's character, which will be important to us later. We establish the jovial, teamwork-esque nature of the squad. And then we toss some world-building exposition uh, out to the readers as well. It's it's so great. Yeah. So, yeah, we're and, and, and again, as you were saying, the exposition is, is coming in, but it's, it's not overwhelming. We're learning that the target's name is Jamie Rink. Uh, I think that's how I'm going to say it. Uh, he's a loner, a quiet one. He triggered when he lost his job. And and then they say, span of a few days, quaint little Ellisburg disappears from the grid. Communications and power cut. No cars or people getting out. Guys upstairs sent in some sent some heroes in. We get a brief report before they defaulted to radio silence. Report doesn't tell us anything except they think the whole crime spree was all the one guy. Yeah, and like you said, so much of this dialogue is just exposition. But it's exposition that's just dripping with so much character that we either don't notice or don't care um like like if you think about it it really doesn't make sense that this briefing would happen now while they're already in the field um but it it doesn't matter because it works and it's just just has so much character to it that you're you're not even realizing things are just being expounded upon yeah i mean this is totally how james cameron would do this so therefore i approve yeah yeah so as they move into town we find abandoned cars broken windows but no bodies no blood other squads notice there aren't any animals around either, and Evan, the commander, realizes there aren't even any bugs. Taylor, what did you do? <laughs> I, did, did you have that reaction at that moment? I mean, I, I didn't believe, of course I didn't believe, I think it says what year this is, so obviously this is not Taylor, but I, I do like that the bugs part is specifically called out because of how much we know and understand about bugs. Um, yeah, that's true. In, in relation to Taylor's power, it feels like a, a kind of a wink to us a little bit, and I appreciated it. Yeah. So then, coming around the corner, we see a giant, ten foot tall, obese monster carrying a sack, dressed in jester's motley, uh, which is, as usual, worse than whatever it is that I was imagining at this point. Uh, Scott, your feelings? <laughs> Have you ever played uh, Left 4 Dead, uh, the zombie video game uh, that Valve made? Yeah. There's those yeah. giant fat guys called Boomers. Um, that's Uh what I imagine, except like a jester. Uh, and it's really, it's crazy. It's creepy. 
Yeah, I'm not sure why the gesture aspect makes it so much worse, but it does. It's just, it's just, it's like beyond the, it's, it's beyond just weird. It's like monstrous and strange. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, so they blow it apart with incendiary grenades and gunfire. Uh, the bloated stomach split with the weight of the upper body, tearing across one of the recesses of a roll of fat. A slurry of half dissolved bodies spilled out around him. A slurry of bodies, Scott. Yeah, it's great word usage. It really is. It gets across exactly what Wild Bo wants. Um, it's gross. It's so disgusting. Uh, I'm glad he's dead now, though, and uh, nothing yeah. nothing else bad will happen for the rest of the chapter. Yeah, I guess this arc, this uh, this chapter's over now. It's weird. Um, Short. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, they wait for the body to burn, but then they hear gunfire. They move to support Squad One, which is hemmed in by waist-high figures with oversized heads, which is just <laughs> terrifying. Uh, something is launching bone spires at the troopers, which pierces their armor. As an aside, arrows fired from compound bows can penetrate bulletproof armor in some cases. What matters is the kinetic energy of the projectile, and, and in this case, a spear has a ton of it. So they realize at this point, too late I suppose, that Rink is a master, not a changer, and he's a master who has created all of these creatures. Yeah. Uh, so let's just let's just bask in these monster descriptions for a second. I'm just going to like pull out snippets. A skinny, faceless woman with blades for fingertips. A trio of what looked like babies with spider legs. A half dozen waist high people with deformed features and mismatched clothing that they clearly scavenged from nearby. And then there are also flying ones, acid spitting ones and subterranean digging ones. So they're basically the Zerg. Yeah, Zerg who were motley. Oh, that's worse. Yeah. Yeah, I like this because he's presumably like almost like a a skitter panacea hybrid where he can not only take biology and create horrible shit out of it um but then also control that horrible shit um this is somehow worse than bone saw no just kidding bone saw's still worse. <laughs> yeah i think bone saw's probably worse yeah gonna gonna go with that um so soon evan realizes that they're surrounded by probably hundreds of flashing eyes in the dark um and then just another moment of great like horror. The horrible thought that they might be people crossed his mind. The notion that this was a psychological trick, that he was under the influence of a power gunning down civilians. And then in a bit, if this was a trick, it was complete and effective enough that they were already doomed no matter what they did. And this to me is just the kind of thing that makes it clear that superpowers is already a horror premise intrinsically. Yeah, right. Um, and I think this really does serve to demonstrate how brave being a member of the PRT is. Um, you're always on the weaker side of any encounter. Always. You're always overmatched. You always have a very little clue as to what exactly you're going to be dealing with. Um, there's a part in Batman vs. Superman. I can't believe I'm referencing that movie, but um, where Batman says that Superman isn't brave because he's Superman. Um except it's way better than that because that movie is fucking terrible and that's not the kind of bravery that superman represents so fuck you batman versus superman anyway the point is uh the prt soldiers are really cool and really brave and you just have a, just an immense level of respect for them yeah and it and like you said we've wanted to get in their head for a while and this does not disappoint yeah yeah so so squad two loses a lot of people as they make egress uh, choppers one and two are down, and the capes with the other squad vacated the scene. Uh, the survivors try to make it to the last uh, choppa, uh, and then they spot Rink himself, and Evan shoots him, and the creatures freak out. Yeah, by vacated the scene, you mean fled like little cowards compared to our poor PRT soldiers? Um, yeah. I'm really curious if we'll ever find out who the capes were that were involved in this mission. I think they said they were from Toronto. Do we know anyone up there? I don't know. I don't remember. Um, but I, I agree that this is a fantastic touch that these that the, the, the capes who were with them who were like, you know, supposed to be the ones who were there to, to help and, and to, to stand up to, to the real threat. They just they just booked it. Yeah, they're um, almost supposed to be backing up the capes. It's not really the other way around. Yeah. Um, and they just say, oh, bye. We have the ability to leave because we have superpowers. So, yeah, you guys catch your, your choppers. Yeah. And just another beat here where. Um, I, I, see, I, I'm going to read it, but I'm not going to do as good a job as the audiobook did because uh, this is like one of my favorite line readings from the audiobook because it just sounds so deranged. But it's, uh, you would shoot me, Rink roared. If anything, his voice was all the more terrifying because it sounded so small, so human. I create life. I am a god, and this is my garden. Um, just 
just love it. It's just so yeah. I, I didn't listen to the audiobook on this one, um, so I'll have to I'll have to go back and listen to that. Yeah. So yeah, Evan takes a few spears to the gut at this point and dies as the chopper comes in to retrieve the remnants of his squad. Man, poor Hudson. I mean Hicks. I mean Apone. I mean Frost. I mean Vasquez. I mean Gorman. I mean where's Baski? Oh, I mean Evan. His his name's Evan. I'm sorry. Sorry. Yes. Matt, all those alien soldier names were from memory. Are you are you proud of me? I am proud of you. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely, Scott. Um, yeah, but Lady wakes up attached to machinery, not doing too great. Uh, a tall man named Thomas Calvert is uh, in bed across the room, apparently uninjured. Uh, somebody's probably going to tell me his name is Calvert or something, but I'm just going to go with Calvert. Um, and uh, he's talking to her. He tells her that her kidneys are gone and the muscles in her legs are damaged and that her career in the PRT squad, as a PRT squad member is over. Uh, Rink, now known as Nilbog, is going to survive, and they're going to wall off Ellisburg rather than deal with the consequences of trying to root out his little garden. Man, it really points against the government of of this country and the world um, that they just let these things happen. Um, But that's so that we've heard of this guy before. Um, I think he was briefly mentioned in the PRT uh, briefing during the wards interlude, Um, and he is terrifying. So between the Endbringers, the Slaughterhouse Nine, uh, Cauldron, and now this guy, um, the world seems kind of rightly fucked, doesn't it? Yeah, um, it's... It, uh, first of all, I'm impressed that you remembered Nilbog's name from like the throwaway reference, <laughs> however long ago that was. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he's he's definitely like one of the big threats, and it's, and it's cool to like get this really nice slice of, of origin story and backstory. Um, and, and yeah, like if, if this is the kind of manifestation that just like, a, 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 that a Cape power can take, um, it's surprising things aren't worse than they are. I agree. Yeah. And part of me wonders if the reason they're letting this happen is Cauldron. If Cauldron's saying, um, whatever goal we have, we want this guy alive for it. Um, so they're going to like come up with an excuse for why the protectorate and why the governments of the world are not doing anything about him or just letting him do him. Um, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to withhold my response to that, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, there's a, it, there's, it, a, it is, yeah. It, there's a really uh, be, tiny bee here that I wanted to pull out where, uh, Thomas Calvert says, yeah, it's a perk of having a power that you get to decide which rules apply to you. And that's just like, a character just spouting one of the major themes of Worm right there. So, yeah, there it is. Yeah. Hi. Right. So, yeah, so speaking of, of Calvert, uh, he confesses that he had hoped that he would trigger, but he didn't. And uh, Lady confesses that she's glad she didn't uh, because she's angry at the capes. She's kind of angry at cape kind as she sees it. Maybe she even hates them. Uh, uh, freaks, monsters, lunatics and bullies, she calls them. Yeah. And this coupled with the fact that it was capes that were backing them up that uh, fled and left them to die. Uh, yeah, it's, it, she. It, we can see why this person um, ends up really hating capes. Yep. Uh, so, so Calvert tells her that she'll probably be made a PRT director now, uh, so she'll need to keep a lid on that particular perspective. Uh, and then he confesses that he shot his squad captain to save his own skin, and he'll be going to prison for a while. Yeah, what a, what a beacon of goodness this guy is, huh, Matt? Um, yeah. So I heavily hinted to you in a conversation without actually saying who I think it is, but I, I have a really outlandish guess at who Thomas Calvert is. Um, I think I'm going to save that for another episode, though. Uh, I, I want to gather a bit more evidence first, but I have a very strong hint at, at to who this guy might end up being. Oh, OK, Scott. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And then, of course, uh, the chapter ends with. It's like the world's gone mad and I'm the only sane person left, which if you have a good memory, you would remember was uh, Pigot's little little refrain from uh, from previously. This one, um, I didn't remember the no swearing one, Matt, but, but this one, <laughs> this one I caught on to. Yeah. Um, and this line is perfect here, not just because it clarifies that this, that this is Pigot, which I suppose we kind of should have figured out by now. Um although I don't remember if I did, frankly, uh, but it, it clarifies exactly where um, this uh, this mentality of hers crystallized in the first place, and it segues wonderfully into what came before it and what and what comes next, uh, while tying into yeah, uh, it just it really nicely nicely integrates with this arc. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and 
I can't state how important it is that Lady was very clearly not this person before this moment because the story took time to see who she is. To see she's the one that cracks the jovial joke um, through their nervousness. This situation has changed her, not just physically, but fundamentally at her core. Um, Pigot makes sense now. Um, she's she's just like everyone else, and she's a product of her past trauma. Um, and it's remarkable. It's so good. Yeah, yeah. And, and that calls forward to something that I, I think we're going to get to in, in a couple minutes yep. uh, regarding regarding humans and parahumans and trauma. Hey guys, we wanted to try something new today, so we thought we'd interrupt your regularly scheduled podcast and drop all of our fun announcements and stuff in the middle of the show. We stole this from other podcasts. It's cool. Uh, Art is a collaboration. Uh, First, we wanted to remind you all that the first We've Got Worm fan art contest is underway. Entries are still open for the next week, and you can submit them to gotwormpod at gmail.com. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you can also email us whenever you want to talk to us about anything. If you have questions, if you have comments, you can email us at gotwormpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at gotwormpod. Um, my personal Twitter is at scottdaily85, and Matt's is mordenfabzibbe. Just, just read it. It's, it's, it's somewhere on the page. It's just there. Look. It's there. Yeah. So if, if you're not already subscribed to We've Got Worm, we strongly recommend you do so and never miss an episode. You can find us uh, anywhere podcasts are sold. Um, yeah. Yeah, and you can find uh, this podcast, all the other podcasts we do, all of our writing, essays, film and TV criticism, and more at dailyplanetphillips.com. I promised I was going to get back into writing when I got back from my trip, and this is the first day I've been back, so I haven't written anything yet, but it's happening. I have a lot of ideas for articles and series and fun stuff, so it's going to be cool. We're looking forward to it. We also have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash dailyplanetfilms. Uh, if you like what we do here and want to help make sure we keep doing more, please consider donating a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford. Uh, we are catching up, obviously, for the last several weeks. Uh, so special thanks to the following new producers. Dark Glass 57, Kurt M, Funky, Cape Morning, and Romaine D. And uh, to our new senior associate producer donating at the $20 level, Tony W. Tony, you are our first senior associate producer. Uh, so not only is Tony entitled uh, to put that on his uh, resume now, uh, but he's invited to join our monthly Q&A session. Yeah, thank God, because those those monthly Q&A sessions have been really boring uh, for the last several years uh, with just the two of us sitting in silence for an hour and then yeah, going tell home. Yeah, about it. <laughs> it's over, Scott. <laughs> uh, also, but, but go ahead. In all seriousness, um, we're going to have to find a way to do something with that. Um, since we only have one person at that level, Tony, um, you can ask us questions and maybe <laughs> we'll, we'll uh, record us answering them if you want. Um, we're still working through that. We might we might be changing around our Patreon rewards a little bit um, based on some of the stuff. Some of the stuff we put in there, we hadn't really thought it through. Um, of course, everyone that's donating at their current level, they will be grandfathered into whatever that thing is. Um, so we'll just we'll notify you of that. Um, but that's yeah. coming in the future. We'll figure that out as we go. Uh, but thank you so much for all your donations. This is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever we change, it's all going to make sense and everybody's going to be happy. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and of course, while you're over there at Patreon, make sure you stop by Wild Bo's page and toss some money there because he's the guy that makes this whole thing possible. Yeah, and as always, if you're one of those that can't spare any extra cash, we do completely understand. But there are tons of ways that you can help us out. Um, you can you can tell all your friends you know that read Worm, that don't read Worm, um, your family, uh, people at work, all of them. Tell us to listen to the podcast because we do have friends of mine who have started reading this book now that are listening along with us. And it's great for new readers. It's great for old readers. Um, and And we love that. You can also review us on iTunes. Um, if you could just take a quick second to rate and review us there, if that's where you listen to us. Well, we got so many new reviews while I was out of the country, Matt, so we're going to be playing catch-up for the next few weeks um, as we get through all the new ones. Today's comes from NoSag544, uh, who gives us five stars and says, If you've just finished reading Worm or have been wanting to reread, this podcast is a great way to go back through Wild Bo's Amazing Worm and enjoy what you missed the first time. 
Jason Backwards, I completely agree with you. Um, thank you so much for your kind words and taking the time to review us. I love that what we do is both appreciated by people who have read the book many times, uh, or, or one time, or zero times. Uh, we're trying to appeal to everyone, and I'm glad that at least to some of you, we are succeeding. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Uh, all right, Scott, uh, let's get back into the second half of the episode. Yeah, so, so on the beach... Uh, Gru puts darkness over Pigo's head so they can talk freely. Gru and Trickster then argue about whether to use Pigo's unjammed phone to contact Tattletail, and Trickster pretty much forces the issue. Yeah, poor Gru uh, loses like literally every argument he takes part in. Um, he's always on the losing side of, uh, side of these things. And it really makes you wonder what the team and the situation in Brockton Bay would look like if he actually won these arguments. And And honestly, my guess is that a lot more people would be dead um, which is, I guess, kind of an argument against pragmatism, but I, I think I think this gets this the central issue with with Gru himself is that he's he's playing in this high risk game, like being an underside or being on this team is putting yourself in high risk situations just naturally, but he's never willing to play a hand in that game. Like there's there's nothing inherently wrong with being pra- pragmatic and risk averse. But maybe he just needs to be not playing this particular game. Yeah, I, I love that that metaphor, and that explains succinctly why I'm bad at poker. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Pigo is giving them uh, potentially tactically useful information, uh, but I think this is partly to show how confident she is that it doesn't matter, uh, and it could even be minor disinformation regarding the suit safety protocols. Yeah, especially considering what we eventually learn at the end of these chapters, uh, that it's pretty pretty clear that Pigot is at least partially bluffing with some of the stuff she's saying here. Um, she's trying to paint their situation as if they're totally screwed, um, but the reality is kind of otherwise. But yeah, she's, she's regardless, she's very confident. So there's, basically she starts really needling Skitter specifically and trying to get under her skin, kind of a continuation of what she was doing back in the HQ, actually. Yeah. Um, and, and Skitter responds like basically pushing back against Pigot, implying that the undersiders started this this conflict, saying, when are you saying we started this war? When the ABB came after us and we fought back? When we ambushed the fundraiser to embarrass you? When we fought Leviathan and the Slaughterhouse-Nine and then picked up the pieces ourselves, clearing our territories of the low-level threats while leaving the civilians more or less alone? Yeah, I like this quote a lot because I like that she included the fundraiser part for some reason. <laughs> because the rest of these things are things that the undersiders did to defeat bad guys and in an attempt to do good. Them just going to the fundraisers, them just kind of being dickholes. Um, yeah. Maybe leave that one out of your argument. Yep. Uh, it's just really funny that she picked that one. Right. When, when are you saying I started this argument? When I slapped you in the face? Is <laughs> that it? No? Yes? Yeah. Um... And then, and then a bit later on, uh, uh, right and wrong aren't a matter of adding the good deeds and subtracting the bad. Uh, to which Regent replies, I'm bad at math anyways. Yeah, it's, it's a perfect little Regent moment, but it also, it clearly Pigo is just talking to Skitter here, and she's going yeah. right for the throat. Yeah, and, and Pigo seems to have an excellent read on Skitter on top of all that. Yeah, yeah so w- once again, Pigo is smart and she's hammering on points that Skitter is weak on and that she hasn't had time to shore up with her justifications. Uh, she's talking about all the damage done and the typical operation of Coyle's criminal money making enterprises. She tries to hang back at his bombing campaign on Skitter too, and Skitter says that she's not to blame, um, which is kind of something we'd wanted to be mentioned for some time. Um, it's hard for Skitter. To keep up her protests, because Pigot keeps refuting her, quite adeptly dodging her attempts at closing down the self-doubt that Skitter's experiencing, and eventually she stops needling Skitter when it's clear that she's pretty much accomplished her goal of unsettling her. And then they leave the beach in the truck that Imp used, uh, and the director cooperates, which uh, Skitter doesn't quite know what to make of. Yeah, I, I wanted to let you just go and read all that, because I wanted to talk about this as a whole. Because yeah. I'm not... 
overly interested in whether or not Pico is right here. I think she makes some very good points um, that we as people owe some responsibility for the things that we were involved in, even if it's not directly involved in. Um, Though I do agree that uh, the blame for murders should probably lie at the feet of the murderers. Um, But that's not important for this what what is what is important is that this moral onslaught is completely disarming taylor and she can't take it and the only way she deals with it is just agreeing with regent that they just need to stop um and and she says not only had it been going nowhere but she had she'd had the upper hand so to speak not necessarily in the strength and validity of her arguments but in the psychological and emotional sense i'd failed to budge her and she provoked a response from me and that's a really interesting comment because Taylor's almost saying here that her arguments weren't strong or valid, but they succeeded in making her feel bad, um, which, which is, is, is an interesting point of view coming from Taylor. Yeah, it's almost like Taylor is dismissing the arguments a priori, like, no, no, I know I'm right. So whatever <laughs> it is you're saying, even though it's making me really uncomfortable, can't possibly be right because I'm doing all of this for Dinah. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, so... Yeah. At this point, there's there's a section break, which is a relatively rare thing, actually, I think. Uh, and then they meet with Tattletail. Uh, and there's another wonderful Taylor moment of using a hand to steady a wobbly pigo, uh, even while thinking about how she doesn't like her because she's an authority figure and therefore a bully and reminds her of Emma and how psychologically manipulative she is. Yeah, I love this so much because you do see Taylor help her in this moment and then like feel bad about helping her. Um, and then she immediately switches to insulting her. I particularly like how Taylor, when he, she's trying to gather ammunition for why she should be mad at Pigot, is saying that she's indirectly responsible for Armsmaster and Sophia because she leads the PRT. Um, and, and specifically she says, and the other bully is getting away with what they did, which is an extremely broad statement. What bullies are you even talking about? All of them. Um, but moments ago, Taylor argued that her indirect involvements that led to people getting killed or hurt are not her fault. But now the indirect actions of Pigot that led to people bullying people are all Pigot's fault. Uh, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like she has some kind of terribly skewed perspective on things. <laughs> Yeah, so then uh, Tattletail starts being psychologically manipulative to Pigot in exactly the same way that uh, Pigot was trying to do Taylor, although this doesn't bother Taylor for some reason. Um, Tattletail is trying to draw information out of her in her usual way. She figures out that Dragon herself isn't in town currently, um, even though that statement is nearly meaningless since she's an AI. Uh, <laughs> but we'll, we'll, anyway, but they don't know she, that. They, they don't know that, but, but we'll later see why Dragon's attention isn't fully on this situation. Uh, so Pigot reveals that she's confident they won't use Regent on her because he can't lose in his control on Shatterbird. They won't torture or threaten to kill her um, because it's not in their nature to do so. And she says uh, that she'll be home by midnight. Uh, she's also trying to play up the fact that she knows that re- what Regent did to Shatter, uh, Shadowstalker uh, and the others don't except for Tattles. And uh, Lisa says, do you trust me? Uh, Pretty much, I replied. A little bit less right now than I did a minute ago. <laughs> That's a really great comment. I, I love it a lot. Um, and I wonder what Taylor's reaction to the truth will be um, when she has that conversation with her, when she finds out what Regent did to Shadowstalker. Um, my guess is she will feign that it was too far. She'll get mad at Regent. She'll get mad at Tattletail for uh, hiding it. And then uh, she'll get over it and move on. Maybe even she'll say something to the effect of, I didn't like it, but Sophia wasn't a good person. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, I could see some something like that. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, this is this is like Pigot's, um confidence here is almost reminiscent of Taylor. Like Pigot's has her own toolbox and she's pulling all this information to make these conclusions. Um, and she's kind of right on the money with all of this. Like she's she has such a good read on these characters and it shows Pigot's dedication to her cause um, really well. Yeah. Yeah, we we kind of admire her strength. I think it probably helps that we know that she's like in her core, this like badass commando who right. just, you know, had a, a bad thing happen to her. And now she doesn't seem that way anymore, but that's really who she is. Yeah. So the director uh, needles Tattletail, Lisa, Sarah, oh. about her brother. And Tattletail covers it with that excessive cheer that we know is fake. Is this like the first hint that my speculation, my crazy left field speculation might be partially right? Um, I said sister when I made this to more closely align with Taylor, but 
brother would work. Um, I'm so confident about this one, Matt. I can't wait to find out. All right. All right, Scott. Uh, so Pigot describes uh, how she herself will die pretty fast without her nightly hemodialysis. So either they need to uh, let her go home or they need to kill her. Yeah, so now we have a clock and a moral issue forced on the Undersiders. I was really interested in this, and I was really excited in seeing how this would resolve. Um, and that it seemingly doesn't is one of the most disappointing things about the arc for me. Uh, we'll get into that later, though. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, she uh, she turns back uh, on Tattletale, um, mentioning her parents also. And this is one of the first times I think that Tattletale has gotten overtly pissed off. Yeah, the, the master of reading people and context clues doesn't like it when other people seem to know uh, information about her, um, especially when it's something related to her trigger event. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, this 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 moment from Pigo, which it's interesting because like. I'll just read it first. But I'm tenacious. I'm shameless if I have to be because I refuse to, to lose to you. Her voice bordered on a growl as she uttered the word refuse. Um, and, and it's interesting because like this is like shocking to these characters in this moment. But but really, it's just to, to us. It's like, well, there's our lady. You know, people don't like people don't like Pigo, but but I kind of like her. She's she's tough as nails. Yeah, uh, I think Taylor herself hints that this or she when she first thought of Pigo, she thought of her as a coil esque type person. But this is dramatically different from the type of person coil is. Um, it is very shocking, and, and I'm glad we get the setup to see exactly who this person is and why they're that way. Um, and I like Pico a lot, too. Um, it, it's very obvious that she isn't a great person. Um, in her vendetta against Cape Manity, she is clearly kind of blinded by this hatred, but she's strong. She's a human in a Cape world, and she's made it her life work with, without any powers to learn people, to learn things, to learn how to beat these people. And even though she's the one tied up and captured, it's clear here that she has never not had the upper hand throughout the entire exchange. And she knows who she is, she knows what she is, and she doesn't wallow in it, she doesn't, uh, she's not sad and, and upset about it, she accepts it and continues to fight. And she's, she's a great character. Totally, yeah, that, that's right. Uh... As a wise man once said, Scott, never forget who you are and wear it like armor for all dwarfs or bastards in their father's eyes. Okay, but Matt, she's not she's not a dwarf. I mean I think you're confused. I don't I don't know. <laughs> and then there's this line, we retreated from the woman. Uh, not just we walked away, retreated. The cat wild boat, that's just <laughs> so good. Yeah. Yeah. Um I, I love I, I get like a very clear visual of that. So, and so, yeah, they're 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 powwowing. Uh, Lisa is out of sorts, unhappy, uh, but guesses that talking to Pigo, sorry, uh, that taking Pigo to her house will lead to a trap. Uh, Regent suggests torture again. Uh, torture doesn't work, Gru said. Without getting into too much detail, I'd say it does. Sometimes, Regent replied. <laughs> hey, um, we could have a whole moral argument about uh, torture and whether it works or not, but uh, let's just leave that for the Reddit thread <laughs> and yeah. and just say the important thing here is that our heroes are lost, confused, and getting pretty desperate, and it's a hell of a situation to find themselves in. Yeah, uh, there, there's a lengthy bit here. I'm not. I'm just going to summarize it instead of reading the whole thing. But but basically, um, there's this moment where um, Tattletale is is emphasizing that. Basically, it culminates in saying, um, but even people without powers are walking issues. That's no big surprise. Having powers just makes it all more noticeable. So, 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 so we were just kind of admiring some of Pigot's qualities, but, but here they're certainly casting them, maybe fairly, maybe unfairly, as like she has her own trauma, which is in some sense like calcified in her and driving her actions. And she's just as capable as being kind of dominated by that trauma as as a cape is. Um, yeah. Yeah. The difference, of course, is unless you're the director of the PRT or like the president, your trauma doesn't lead to the <laughs> deaths of a shit ton of people like it, it can for a cape. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think that's that's heavily implied to who to Tattletale's uh, noticeable <laughs> quote, which noticeable is putting it pretty uh, put it <laughs> mildly yeah right i agree um 
so uh yeah imps uh like like what you thought was a joke suggestion of cramming a sweaty stinking sock in the director's mouth is actually the one that they go with because they literally can't think of a better idea yeah and i love this because our characters are sitting here racking their brains about how to deal with someone who's so clearly their intellectual superior here and the solution they come to is make her eat stinky foot sock and deal with the problem later um it's just it's just so like the lowest uh intelligence type of solution to this <laughs> and it's it's so great um the the part i really liked in this though is when taylor says uh trouble with this sort of gag is that if she pukes she could choke on her own vomit and Regent is just like, how do you know these things? It's this wonderful <laughs> moment. Uh, she watched a few good men, Scott. Oh, of course. Of course. Yeah. So, yeah, Skitter decides the teams should split up at this point. Grew with Sundancer and Trickster, since their powers are complementary. And Regent, Shatterbird, and Imp will come with Skitter. Before they leave, Pigot brags about Dragon's new suits, six of which are improvements on old models, and one of which is the entirely new Azazel built in collaboration with Defiant. Yeah, and we'll get to this when we fight the Azazel in a few chapters, but this is big build-up. This is, oh my god, this is going to be the most powerful thing you've ever fought before, Taylor. Um, and, yeah. and that doesn't exactly happen. Yeah. So they try to puzzle uh, 16.4. Uh, they try to puzzle out a way to get to Rachel's new territory quickly, uh, which is the train yards. Skitter offhandedly mentions thinking about using Sundancer to create a hot air balloon, <laughs> and <laughs> Imp suggests a James and the Giant Peach scenario in using bugs. Uh, but they end up using Shatterbird to partially levitate a door uh, with Regent, Imp, and Skitter standing on it, uh, dragging it along on, like a surfboard at 50, 50 miles an hour on the roads. Yeah, as much as I love this ridiculous image of a hover door, um, I really wish we would have gotten to see the, the flying hot air balloon or like the bug flying. Yeah. At, like, I want that all in my life right now. It's so yeah. funny. Totally. Um yeah, I love this beat where Regent waits to the last second to knock down a fence in their path, and Imp and Regent cackle at Skitter's discomfiture. Yeah, it's so great. Um, not only do we get to see how much alike Imp and Regent are, um, and, but we also get to see like how much the mom of the group, Taylor, has kind of naturally become. Um, um, these guys, like All these people are children, but these two in particular are more children than the rest of them. Yeah. Yeah, so... They, they reach Rachel's territory and they find a dragon suit that pulls scrap metal into itself to self-repair. Barker, Biter, and all the available dogs have apparently been hammering on it for quite some time, and all they've managed to do is exhaust themselves. Yeah, Rachel's exasperated, it won't die moments are so wonderful. And if, if, we, if we rewind time and think about um, when the suits first showed up, uh, are we to assume that Rachel has just been like perpetually fighting it since then? Because um, we had Skitter's first encounter with the drones. They met at Coils. They fight at the PRT. Then they have this whole conversation with Pigo. So this whole time, <laughs> Rachel and her dogs are just continually fighting. That's awesome. Yeah. Even if that's not true, I'm going to choose to believe that yeah. it is because yeah. it's it's more hilarious. So there's this little moment in here where Taylor asks, uh, and this is maybe an idiosyncratic syncretic thing for me to pull out but uh taylor asks if imp has taken the first aid training that she was told to do and she says no she hasn't and really it's pretty obvious that she wouldn't have had time to since they've been fighting or locking down territory or doing some crazy thing for 100 percent of the time since imp joined the team but taylor is like furious at her and, and quite dismissive of her because Imp, Imp is not like able to fulfill the role that Taylor wants her to fulfill. Mm -hmm. And and Imp responds by just kind of saying, okay, and, and not really making a big deal of it. Um, so maybe I'm digging too deep here, but I, I read this as an instance of Taylor trying to toolbox a situation and finding a person to be an inadequate tool and then becoming like really frustrated with them. And, and then kind of in response to that, Imp is actually showing a little bit of maturity. Yeah, I, I agree with the first part. I'm not sure if it shows maturity in Imp, so much as the undersiders of a whole are just slowly learning that sometimes Taylor's just going to tailor, and <laughs> the only yeah. the only thing you can do in this situation is just to, like, get out of her way. Um, uh -huh. Let's once again hit the beat that being Taylor's teammate would be really annoying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so at a certain point, um, they damage it with an intense combo attack. Uh and then it reincarnates, essentially turning inside out, consuming its own damaged exterior and replacing it with parts that were cooking on the inside. Um, 
So, Scott, can we talk about names for a second? Yeah, sure. Okay. Because I have been wanting uh, to talk, to, to nerd out about Wildbow names for the last 20 you know, episodes or so. Let's do it. Um, yeah, so, so this suit, and I'm going to mispronounce all of these. That's fine. This suit is the Melusine, and Melusine is basically an early serpent-type mermaid, mermaid legend. Uh, and she was a shapeshifter who transformed in at least one story into a dragon. And the Melusine is also a water sp- spirit, and this is the suit that fought Leviathan, or at least it resembles it. So there's that connection. Uh, Pythias is in some cases another name for Apollo and uses the sun-like lightning wheel uh, in, in his, in, in the, rather the mech uses the, the lightning wheel. Um, alternatively, Python was a snake or dragon demon that Apollo killed. Regardless, Apollo and snakes are related in myth, so relating a sort of sun imagery to that particular dragon suit is fitting. Mm-hmm. Laid on, uh, the force field generator, who went after Sundancer, uh, is a protector dragon, which goes well with force fields. He guarded the golden apples of the tree of the Garden of Hesperides, and he was one of the trials of, Hercu- of uh, Hercules or Heracles, which, whichever. Uh, Glaurung is the drone-deploying suit, and Glaurung was the father of the race of dragons created by Morgoth uh, in Tolkien Silmarillion. So he sired the dragons in the way the drone suit sires the drones, I suppose. Uh, Astaroth Nidhug, I don't know how to say that at all, uh, is the heavy artillery suit, uh, the giant gun that we hear about later. Uh, Nidug uh, is a dragon that gnaws at the roots of Yggdrasil, and Astaroth is a winged duke of hell who rides a dragon. So I guess they're heavy hitters is, is the connection there. That one's less obvious to me. That makes sense um, to me. And then, and then we've got Azazel, an, another dragon duke of hell. Uh, um, by the way, Scott, you're being super paranoid for being suspicious of somebody who names their creations after demons. Um <laughs> Yeah, so, and, and of course, there's the Dead Sea Scroll about how the demon Azazel was uh, an ancient dragon mech who created nanotechnology barriers. Uh, just kidding. Azazel is associated with sacrifice and literally means for the complete removal, which I guess is kind of what the nanothorns do on a physical le- level. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Cawthorn, I couldn't find a good, like, reference for, other than that it's a dragon. Um, so... All of Wildbow's names are, are like at least this meaningful. That they usually not only have a meaning, but they'll often have like a meaning in the story that, that would make sense to the characters themselves. And then often like another metaphorical meaning for the readers. Like speaking of dragon names, we mentioned before that Lung means dragon in Mandarin, but like Lung is covered in tattoos in a way that we typically associate with Japanese gangsters. So that's like that's like it's like, well, what's going on there? Um like an imp is a mischievous devil, which suits imp's power. But imp is also impish, as in, like, as a person, she's inclined to do naughty things for fun, which is the definition of impish. Uh, and, and an imp is also specifically a mischievous child. Like, there's another definition of the word imp. Yeah. Um, so, I, like, you can go as deep as you want with pretty much all the names. Like, like pick one, and you can just, like, you can just find a, a number of connections that at least some of which I'm sure are meaningful. Like, like why would you pick the name Triumph unless you had, like, as a character, unless you had a deeply competitive mindset, unless you were somebody who, you know, like a competitive athlete viewed things in terms of winning and losing. Yeah. And, you know, final bonus, uh, Hebert, um, one of the meanings is army, which is sort of what Taylor is. Oh, that's that's you know? perfect. That's awesome. That's, that's really cool, Matt. I, I liked all of that. A lot. Um, I didn't have a lot to contribute since I didn't know anything about those dragon names. You know, like I have read a lot of mythology, but a lot of those went right over my head. Um, but I'm glad I know them now. And I think we should try to do this with each of our new characters from now on. I think it'd be a fun little exercise. Um, I like I like specifically when thinking about this, how Lady in this transforms into Pigot. Um, she basically turns into a pig lady. Um, yeah. She shreks it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean that—that that was one that I was that, that I that I wanted to save, you know, because because that that that's kind of the the pertinent one to this arc. But I, I agree that that's probably there's there's something going on there, something intentional going on there. Yeah. Yeah. So so thank you for indulging my interlude, Scott, and everyone <laughs> no, else. No uh, problem. So so back to the story. Uh, after inwardly railing against uh, Tinkers for a bit. Again. Again, yeah. Uh, Skidder proposes that they make one more big attack and then retreat. 
So she realizes that Rachel can't walk away from a fight, and uh, especially one that she feels like she's winning, which is why Dragon sent this particular suit to fight her. Uh, you can feel like you're winning forever and still lose when you're fighting this suit. Yeah, this is a really fun concept, and I like it a lot. I just kind of wish the battle itself was a little more interesting or had any kind of real stakes. Um, you get the feeling that why they might, while they might be like incapable of beating the suit, that the suit really can't beat them either. Um, it's a wonderful idea. I just think in execution, it makes kind of for a boring fight. Um, it doesn't have any kind of propulsion to it. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, I think I agree with you there. Um, you know, it's, it's got a couple of interesting moments here and there, but uh, yeah, but you're just kind of like, okay, let's get let's, let's get on with. Yeah, and it, it goes back like I, I'm sure we'll get into this more, but because these suits are just robots, it's like in Marvel movies where they're fighting just. <laughs> Like in, in Age of Ultron, when they're just fighting thousands of Ultron bots, and it's yeah. like, it, it, I, I don't know, it's just like, when your enemy isn't real, it's like, the, the stakes seem automatically lowered a bit. Yeah, right. It's just, it's just putties, yeah. And, and, and I think this, I mean, this stands out so much, because it's in contrast to the usual Wild Bo fights, where like, you, you very often like, care about everyone in the fight, yeah, yeah. Uh, to one degree or another, or at least you see them as human. Uh, and dragon is the, like literally the suit is not human it's like a rudimentary ai so uh yeah so yeah so the, the last attack involves rachel jousting with it on the back of a more fully transformed bastard while shatterbird packs the suit's injuries with glass and then smashes the suit around telekinetically the suit ends up melting the glass inside itself which may actually have jammed it up and destroyed it but taylor's not sure because they retreat Okay, never mind everything I just said. This part's awesome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Rachel and Bastard forever. One love. Yes. So they all retreat. A small note here. Taylor does still have her relay bugs, but they're they're dying of starvation. Uh, and the chapter ends with Taylor sensing uh, the Azazel. Yeah, I'm glad we brought them back out again, but I also am glad that they're dying. Um, because there does come a point where Taylor approaches the too powerful level. And I think they're really good in a pinch and they serve their purpose. But having them forever i think would be so unfair um if she could just have that level of range constantly would be crazy yeah yeah i think you're right and i'm sure she'll get that range naturally somehow in the future anyway so <laughs> yeah so um 16.5 as taylor inspects the azazel she finds a machine that looks more or less exactly like a dragon rather than like a dragon themed mech uh, with internal workings as complex and intricate as those of a living being Taylor guesses that this is the result of Dragon intuiting and applying defiance power of making things really compact. And she further realizes that all of the suit powers she's seen up to this point were probably borrowed, uh, borrowed from other tinkers. Yeah, and she decides that she thinks that that's Dragon's uh, tinker special specialization, um, though we know that Dragon isn't really a tinker um, because she's just an AI. Or is she? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I suppose we'll see. I suppose we will. Uh, Matt, I, I was so looking forward to this fight when the Azazel was first teased. I was even looking forward to it at the beginning of this chapter. But in actuality, this ends up being like my least favorite action sequence thus far. I just don't like this at all. Um, and we'll get into why specifically, but... Yeah, so so the Azazel extends tubes across an area which bloom with, uh, you know, our master's nanotech disintegration field. A uh, little beat here, Rachel asks Skitter what's wrong, even though she hasn't said anything and is wearing a mask, uh, because as always, Rachel is just instinctively reading body language. Yeah, and again, it's so great how Wildbo can successfully juggle all these, like, tiny character beats all at the same time because this this story has so many characters and each of them are so different but we still find time to include these character specific beats um in this arc alone we see alec with his door skateboard ramp thing uh imp's dirty sock tattletale's sneaky fake enthusiasm uh brian's pragmatism again um sometimes these beats beats matter more than other but we always find time for them, even in the mix of these accent sequence. Like, our core group the, of characters, the Undersiders, they're so well characterized and like from the beginning, but Wildbo never lets up with that characterization. He always finds moments to include characterization for each of them, and, and it makes the story feel more real. 
Yeah, totally. I, I, I agree 100%. That's, that's like my favorite thing. Yeah, so the Azazel and the Glaurung herd the group into the area that the Azazel has filled with disintegration hedges. Skidder takes a gamble and tries to dodge into a shopping mall, but gets dismounted by some discharges from the drones, and the Azazel enmeshes her in a cage of disintegration hedges, which now glow red and orange to signal danger. She tries to fake it out by telling it she's going to fall, and it clears out the hedges under her so she can lie down, uh, but it still has her physically cornered. And that, for the life of me, I thought, at last, this is it. Taylor's caught. This is an inescapable situation. She's finally pushed the envelope too far and gotten in a situation where she can't escape from. Um, of course, that's not what happens, but... Yeah, so, so first she tries, this statement is false, I told it. I'll go with true. There, that was easy, as Azel replied. Yeah, and I think this little beat seems to only reinforce that fact, because this is played almost like a joke. Taylor's trying to outsmart this machine, um, the one designed by two master tinkers, and it's almost laughable that she thought she could do that. But then it turns out that's exactly what she does. That's right, Scott, because uh, employing her toolbox, Taylor analyzes the problem of defeating Azazel. Yeah, she reasons that this thing is probably much stronger and tougher than the Melusine, which she couldn't really do much against. So eventually she writes off attacking it directly and settles for uh, trying to outsmart it again. She bluffs that Imp had a second trigger event, and she rolls a 20 on that bluff, uh, concocting a scenario where it's reasonable that Imp could be in the room and any movement of the Azazel might crush her. So, so this seems to give the Azazel pause, and Skitter uses her matches to burn away some of the nano stuff and uses uh, large, thick spider webs to catch the containment foam that is fired after her. Um, it snags her with a clock blocking grappling hook, uh, but this only holds her in place for a minute uh, and then she sneaks away when it unfreezes. And, and that's it. That's, that's the fight. Um, and I think the idea of outsmarting an AI was a good one. Um, but in execution, it's just like she tries one thing and then wins. And then with the the grappling hook, her solution is just, oh, yeah, this doesn't last very long. I'm just going to do nothing and then win again. And then the fight's over. And it's it's almost like such a such a goofy way to win that it completely like destroys dragon as a threat to me. Um, or at least these not dragon specifically, but these uh, suits. Um which is a real shame because I'm super interested in all this, but then it's just like big powerful robot defeated the end. And it's so weird to me. It feels so clunky and, and rushed to me. And, and I just think like you, like there's, there's really good stuff in here and you could turn it into a really good sequence, but I just didn't like it as presented here. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing here that I, I don't remember if we mentioned it or not, but like if the Azazel's goal was to, to kill them, then they'd just be dead. Like that would have already happened. Um, yeah. And it, it has like a million opportunities to kill them. And it's, and, and it's like completely invulnerable to any like attack that they would, that they would throw at in this situation. But because, because dragon has all these like restrictions, it really like, it, it makes her much weaker and therefore lowers the stakes of the situation and, and, and therefore the drama. And like you were saying, that's, that's kind of all part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the super team arrives and Shatterbird smashes up the debilitated Azazel for a bit until Sundancer delivers the, the coup de gras with her fusion orb. Um, and Taylor, Taylor says, I guess, or sorry. Um, uh, yeah. Taylor says, I guess we're a ways off from an AI being smart enough to work around those, those limitations. It's a matter of time. Regent said, you're such a pessimist and retorted. This is dramatic irony. Yes, that's right. <laughs> it's a good beat. I like it. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, so shortly after they leave the smoking ruins of the Azazel behind, Tattletail calls them on the now working phone and tells them the dragon is gone. Tattletail called the Dragon Slayers, which Dragon probably won't like, and learned that if she took out the cell towers, Dragon wouldn't be able to remotely reprogram the suit so, so well. Uh, so if we read between the lines a little bit, maybe Taylor's head game with the Azazel only worked because the cell towers were down. Yeah, and that, that is a good reason. I just don't know. I still don't know if I like it in, in execution. Yeah. And is this a satellite phone they're talking on, I guess? <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. So there's always the fact that Dragon's mission is supposed to be hunting the Nine, and it looks really bad to the funding agency if, if she destroys all of her suits fighting teenagers. 
Um, so, so legitimately, like there's a good reason why she would pull that now, mm -hmm. I guess. So, so, so Tattletale also tells us that the pure have left town. Um, I'm not sure, like, are they leaving without Victor? Did, did they give Victor back yet? I, I I'm, I'm <laughs> not sure if I'm, uh, maybe I just wasn't paying attention. I don't um, know. But anyway, uh, and, and Fault Line's crew have also left town uh, because they don't want to be there anymore. Uh, so she says the city is ours. And Coral is consequently ordering everyone to stand down for a few days, specifically to not do anything in costume. Yeah, and then on top of the fact that I didn't like the battle, this conclusion to this, th this is like the culmination of everything that the teams have been working towards since uh, after Arc 8. And it's just like, okay... Everyone else is giving up. You win the end. Um, and it just feels kind of rushed and clunky to me. Like, I, I, I know for our main character, the real battle here is just beginning because for her, it's always been get Dinah back from Coil. I know this. But at the moment, it just feels super weird to me that like this is our moment of victory. That it's just like, OK, dragon left. And then we have we have. Oh, yeah, we have the other things we have to close off. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, the pure left. Um, Faultline's crew is gone. Yay. Um, and again, and we have that real crisis moment that was established with Pigo that's just now over. Like they say, uh, Tattletail is going to help her get home. So that's just resolved kind of off screen. Um, there was so much drama and conflict potentially there, and it just was seemingly resolved um, kind of automatically. And look, OK, as I'm saying this, I know that we're only halfway through the arc and I hate that we have to divide these arcs up because I really don't like being critical about something before I've had the chance to see everything come to fruition. There's still eight more chapters left for Wild Bo to do stuff with this and 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 wrap it all up in a way that makes it great. Um, but I was still really kind of shocked at how this moment played out here. And I don't want to harp on it too much because there's so many individual moments around here that I really liked, but, but Skitter vs. Robots was just not my favorite thing at all. Yeah, and I don't want to go into this too much, but I think, I think Wild Bo is aware of the relative weakness of this section. So that's one reason why I don't feel bad about just kind of analyzing what went wrong here because like, I don't feel like I'm crapping all over it. I'm just kind of saying like, this is why I feel it didn't work. And if, 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 if I were to have, you know, my, my say, yeah. it would, it would maybe change X, Y, and Z and that might fix it. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. I think you're absolutely right. And I, I like we, the, the, the interlude that we've talked about is the best interlude in this book for me so far. Like it's so great. So like just because there's parts of this thing that don't work for me does not mean that the thing as a whole isn't great. I still am. I'm loving this book. I enjoyed this arc, but there are parts of it that I just didn't care for. And that yeah. happens. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and as, as I've said, like now a number of times in this podcast, like I would be shocked if there was anything in the like serialized fiction format released at this rate that didn't have like a stumble like that. Yeah, absolutely. It, it would, I, I, it would be impossible yeah so yeah and then we have this moment they've 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 kind of won right so 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 taylor's thinking uh the only thing stopping coil from following through on his end of the deal and releasing dinah was well coil i exhaled so slowly letting out a deep breath that i felt like i'd been holding for a month of course taylor uh coil has always been the only thing keeping coil from releasing dinah you got played, hon. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Taylor is not going to take the news well <laughs> when Dinah is not released, um, because I'm still so convinced that that's just not ever going to happen. Um, and it, like so much of everything that she's been holding on to for these past few weeks is tied up into this little girl. And this is kind of a moment of victory. And chapter 16.6 basically serves as a victory lap for Taylor. Um, but I think after that moment... Uh, things are, are going to get really bad. But first, Matt, let's uh, take a train to Banktown. All right. All aboard. 16.6. <laughs> the group uh, has a bit of banter, uh, some elements arguing that they should throw a big party to celebrate and rub it in in the heroes' faces. Uh, but uh, only Brian is taking the adult position. Yeah, and, and Brian, for maybe the first time ever, wins this argument <laughs> they don't throw a party um so good job brian yeah yeah although you know he he loses one little beat here um but we'll get to that in a second um 
it, it is funny because Skidder's just kind of like listlessly standing there and doesn't quite like know how to, how to behave. Um, and, and Regent says, she's out of it. Tattletail broke Skidder when she said we won, <laughs> um, which is, you know, hilarious, uh, but also just, just, just true because Taylor's having a really hard time accepting that things are really going to be fine for a while after being thrown from disaster to disaster for weeks. That's because they're not, man. <laughs> um, but I do really like the banter here. And it actually reminded me a little bit of the, the PRT squad banter from that interlude. Um, we, we've seen these guys in such high stress situations um, so often that it's it's nice seeing everyone like release a little air. And there's a lot of joking around here and and, and less serious conversation. Um, and you can see that they've kind of become a family in except for a, a few things, which you're about to get into. Yeah. Um, there's, there's this there's this moment where Taylor, I mean, it's 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 just description, right? So imp groaned and agonized sound one might expect from someone who had just been speared through the gut. What did it say about me that my metaphors were tending toward that kind of violent imagery? So so. Just to make it explicit, Taylor's internal monologue actually contains these metaphors. Yeah, I mean, we're in her head. There's no real narrator here. So everything we see on the page, Taylor is either thinking or hearing. And it's kind of funny because it's something I'd kind of been noticing for a few arcs. Um, and it was something I was thinking of bringing up, but uh, Taylor brought it up before I could. So <laughs> good job, Taylor. Um, the thing I wanted to, to, to harp on here is you ever notice how Taylor asks these questions of herself and then makes them rhetorical and never mm -hmm. answers them? Um, <laughs> what does it say about me when? What does it mean when? Why do I? And she ponders all this stuff, but she can't or won't ever actually conclude on it. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. She's she's just like, well, I'm. I'm I'm noticing my descent into into darkness. So uh, <laughs> that's the same thing as averting it, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Brian at, at one point tries to stop Aisha from going to hang out with Alec, uh, which is a bridge too far for her. And she uses her power to slip out of his attention, which derails the conversation. Yeah. I love it. The, the awkward silence moment because everyone just forgot what they were talking about um, from now on in my life. Anytime there's an awkward silence or a dip in a conversation, I'm just going to assume we were all talking to Imp and she just yeah. left. Ah, Aisha. Yeah. So yeah, everybody trails off uh, trickster going to uh, immediately, like immediately going to confront coil about focusing on the travelers specific problems now. Uh, and Brian brings up the prior plans that uh, he and Skitter had made before dragon attacked and rachel immediately correctly reads into this that they're dating um still taylor semi desperately invites rachel to come along with them so she doesn't have to be alone with brian <laughs> rachel third wheeling a date would be the greatest thing ever uh, <laughs> can we make this a sitcom i'm gonna call it my bug lady her puppy and me Man, I can't stop because I'm imagining Brian and Taylor like drinking out of the same milkshake and then Rachel just in between them licking the milkshake up like a dog. <laughs> Can someone draw this for me? This is this is the most hilarious thing in my head. I, I can't get it out. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I write a fanfic about this. <laughs> um, so yeah, so uh, Taylor and Brian enter her lair and find Charlotte and Sierra. Once again, the humans are unnerved by the fact that their supervillain bosses appear to have defeated a powerful, well-known cape. Uh, Sierra tells Taylor that some of her people were chasing down the drones with tarps and trash cans and got shocked for their trouble. Yeah, I want to I uh, want to stop and, and harp on this for a bit, because from their perspective, like boss comes home, asks for some food, leaves, defeats powerful, previously unbeatable thing, <laughs> comes back. Don't worry about it. It's taken care of. Like how weird yeah. an experience for her underlings this must be. Yeah. It's just like going right. back to reports about all the horrible monsters and super powerful people that she's defeated while she was gone. It's crazy. Yeah. Right. yeah. She's like, you know, Monday. Uh, yeah. No, Crawler's dead. Wednesday. <laughs> oh, yeah. We defeated Dragon. I'm fine. Don't worry about it. Can I have some tea, please? Yeah. No, I, I agree. Yeah. So uh, Sierra at this point sort of tries to quit on her when Taylor asks if she'll take over the hands-on management for a few days. Uh, Taylor tries to offer her more money or to just let her use the money to find somebody else she trusts to, to do the job. Uh, but Sierra doesn't want the money 
And this ends with Taylor having to swallow a lump in her throat because it's affecting her quite a bit. Yeah, this interaction is really interesting to me because it almost kind of ties back to uh, Pigot's argument from later in the arc. Uh, Pigot says that although Taylor isn't directly doing bad things, she's she is related to those that are. She's related to Coil. She's dealing with people that do sell drugs, even though she doesn't specifically do it. Um, that she has some culpability, indirectly or not. That's what Pico says. Taylor doesn't really see it that way. But Sierra here does. Um, even if she's not doing the criminal activities, she is supporting the person that's doing those criminal activities. And it's getting to the point where she's not comfortable with it anymore. Um, yeah. so, my, so my speculation at this moment is that Sierra does end up quitting. I don't think she's going to be able to take this. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I mean, and, and as far as its its impact on Taylor goes, I feel like it is a... Uh, like like Taylor feels it as a rebuke to herself. Like like this this person has I don't know how you want to phrase it. Like the, the integrity to 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 attempt to like get out of the situation once it becomes something she's not comfortable with. Uh, whereas Taylor, you know, the queen of doubling down is is like just completely in over her head more than ever now. So um, yeah, it's. Uh, Part of the lump in her throat, I guess, is kind of the the obvious reason is that like someone who she kind of likes and trusts is kind of rejecting her, which which is hard for Taylor specifically. Uh, but also there's this, uh, I think, especially after you pointed this out, I think there's this level of like um, a contrasting behavior, making her look at herself differently. Yeah, I, I think absolutely. And and I really like Sierra as a character. The more we've gotten with her, the more I like her. And I'm curious, like, Taylor's reaction makes it seem like she views this as almost like a friendship on some level. I don't think Sierra sees it that way. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why this, this hits Taylor kind of hard. Yeah, I think you're right. So, yes, yeah, Charlotte also seems... Um... Well, she seems less eager to distance herself from Skitter, but she's equally unexcited about the prospect of being publicly associated with Skitter. I, too, am pretty unexcited about the prospect of being publicly associated with Skitter. <laughs> At least right now. Yeah, right. Yeah, so uh, Taylor and Brian head upstairs to Netflix and chill. Brian opens up the romance by insulting Taylor's lack of an intimidating appearance relative to him. Uh, he's basically just complaining about how he hasn't been about how he hasn't been able to get any henchmen of his own yet, um, and he kind of seems full of shit here. Uh, what do you think, Scott? Like he's complaining about being big and scary looking relative to Taylor, but Aisha is also capable of approaching people, right? So like, uh, it just seems like he's looking for excuses. Yeah, yeah, he's making excuses, and I think part of this is uncomfortable with the situation and what's about to happen part of this is his insecurity in general part of this is he knows that the next thing they're going to be talking about is um the fact that skitter has has been performing as the leader of the group for a while now and uh, that something needs to happen so yeah i think he's kind of lashing out and and grabbing onto excuses to uh, to hide his insecurity and weakness yeah so yeah speaking of which uh he he then brings up the fact that skitter took control of the teams on this last mission and he asks if she wants that to be permanent and she says very politically that she'll take on more of the burdens until he starts getting enough rest um which and and he knows she's right but it's hard for him to accept because he admits that he's the kind of person who would attack weakness in somebody else so it's hard to stomach in himself yeah, and I'm interested in your thought on this, because I know he says that he's that type of person, um, but do you agree with him? Have Has Brian seemed like the person that would attack someone's weaknesses before? I mean, I know he's like a take charge type of person, but I don't know if I've seen him like attack weaknesses before. Yeah, um, I think of Brian, if anything, like his flaws that he's actually like kind of. I don't want to say kind because he's never actually done anything kind. <laughs> I think he's passive. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe he would judge someone for their weaknesses. I, I, I don't know. It's it's I, I agree with you that it, that it's an interesting it's an interesting moment. Like one of my favorite things in fiction is like characters whose self image of themselves clashes with the way they actually are because that's the way humans are like like zero zero yeah. percent of the time does does a person actually have like a an accurate characterization of themselves stored in their mind um 
I mean, yeah, I guess, it's, it's I, interesting. I guess it does line up when we were in his head. His his judging of Taylor's uh, physical flaws um, was very much like seeing weaknesses in someone and pointing them out. But he did it. It was very internal monologue. So like maybe he's projecting that because that's what's going on in his head rather than what he's actually projecting out to other people. And maybe that's part of he says he's been trying to to move away from that type of behavior. So um, I don't know. It's, it's just an interesting little beat. Yeah, it's kind of like how Taylor like characterizes her tendency toward compartmentalization um, in a very self-flattering way when she describes it to someone else. Here, Brian is characterizing his tendencies in a way that that makes him seem yeah. macho when when that's not actually kind of how it is on the inside. I don't know. This yeah. is a very interesting line of thought, though, that I hadn't really considered. Yeah, so Brian masterfully shifts uh, from this subject matter into prompting Taylor to invite him to stay the night. So she queues up some movies and lies down with him and he starts playing with her zipper. And then your podcast hosts become very uncomfortable. And suddenly we shift POV into defiant who is surveying a hospital crime scene. <laughs> uh, just kidding. Um, so, so there are certainly a few points to hit here. Uh, one is that she says she wants to turn off the lights and he responds by blanketing them both in his darkness, which he can see through. Uh, and she thinks this totally wasn't what I'd wanted which works on more than one level, I think. Yeah, th this is a very interesting scene um, because there's so much going on here. Like, you understand a certain level of nervousness in this moment. Um, these are two people who, uh, one of them, and we know at least, has never done this before. Um, but Taylor, like, can't be comfortable in the moment. She can't be happy in the moment. Um, and and then to to add to that, the idea of she's so uncomfortable that she wants it to be dark, and then because she's kind of insecure in herself. And so he darkens it for her, just her and not him. Um, this is very, I think this shows the, the balance of power into the relationship. He's the one pushing this. He's the one that brings up the relationship. He's the one that, that uh, initiates this scene. And he's the one that controls. Um, he can see things. She can't. And this is like, this, this is not a good relationship, Matt. Um, and I worry now that they've taken this step, um, the health of both of them going forward. Yeah, I'm definitely noticing a lot more things second time through, but like the, the, the first thing that jumps into my mind here is that she was really into him several arcs ago and probably would have like been thrilled for this to happen basically. Yeah. Um, but like so much stuff has happened and the, the, you know, the horrifying, you know, slaughterhouse nine thing that happened to him and, and like the drama between them that's like pushed them apart at least two different times actually where like they, they just like weren't talking for periods of time and there's been so much tumult and so much recontextualization that like she's not really nearly as like giddy about brian as she was you know in arc three or whatever um yeah and and so um he, if anything he seems to be the one like you just said, he seems to be the one kind of wanting this to go forward now. And, and she's almost I, I don't want to say this fully, but like it feels like she feels an obligation to it because of what he's been through more than she's like excited about it. I, I don't know. Do you think that's fair at all? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, th there's a certain level of excitement to it. I think she is attracted to Brian. I think she likes Brian, but th them it, it, this specific step of the relationship um it feels like something that she, as you said, was not what she wanted, um, but it's what he wanted. And I think there's a certain amount of sympathy towards Brian and what he's going through um, and a certain amount of her desire for companionship that she's OK with this. Um, but, yeah, it, it's not how you would imagine a, a sex scene between characters going. Yeah, it's it's the standard Brian and Taylor like awkward, not quite what you wanted it to be. Uh, uh, right, comple right. Completely, completely not a Mary Sue moment. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. So yeah, let's let's move on into the final uh, chapter, which is the interlude, uh, Defiant. Uh, so Defiant, you know, we know who this is. Colin uh, investigates the scene of a slaughterhouse nine attack. The first paragraph is pretty devastating. Like, so it's it's clearly a hospital. Uh, full of new parents who seem completely shell-shocked, and even the detectives are just kind of staring into space. 
Yeah, this is a really great tone setting moment. Um, we kind of this arc have been playing in this weird sci fi type world. Um, we have AI robots and, and all this stuff. And there's going to be a lot more sci fi type elements um, in this chapter specifically. But uh, just in case you forgot how horrible the Slaughterhouse Nine are, uh, here, here's them in a nursery. Um, we're back into horror right now. Um, and we're like the undersiders have been. We're in the middle of the aftermath of these characters. And it's mm. it's really great. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, as he passes a taped off window that used to look into a nursery, he notices that his gait feels alien and he makes a note to check whether one of his legs needs to be shortened. Yeah. And this is our first real indication about just how much of Colin is now machine. Um, I did notice I, I haven't been following the Reddit thread as closely because I was on my honeymoon, but I did notice an interesting conversation going on last week about transhumanism specifically related to Colin. Um I, I, I personally find Colin's quest to become less human a, a little discomforting. I think altering your body is one thing when you start messing with your brain. That's something else entirely. But I think it remains to be seen whether Colin's transformation will be good for him or not. I think we'll find out in a bit uh, what Dragon thinks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So he meets with the sheriff, uh, Miranda Goring. And as they make their way through the grisly crime scene, he questions her, asking about the local parahuman scene. He suspects the Nine will be looking to recruit uh, even relatively low-powered parahumans, and uh, there's one here named Damsel of Distress who might be a candidate in his mind. Yeah, I like this name a lot, and I hope we get to see more of her. Um, we also learn about two low-level uh, good guy capes, Edict and Licit, um, which if we're playing the name game, I would guess Edict has some sort of like speaking power, the ability to issue commands or something. Uh, licit, I have no idea. Um, it means legal and permissible, so I don't know how that would tie into a power. Um, but Damsel's power doesn't really seem to tie into her name either, or at least from what I understand of it, so no, no idea. Yeah, right. So the sheriff uh, gets choked up as she tries to describe the progression of the attack, and he doesn't know what to say to her. Uh, so at this point, this is for the first time, Dragon speaks into his ear and gives him some notes on how to handle the human side of things. And he says, there was nothing you could have done differently knowing what you did. He finished feeling like he was leaving the explanation incomplete. If it were him on the other side of things, he'd want the full picture, but he would take Dragon's advice. Um, so this is, it's, I mean, it's really funny because if anything, I'm I'm kind of like this, where like sometimes don't know what to say to people, and, and I'm like I, I I I feel like the the part where it would be socially correct for me to stop is is before I want to stop, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I can't. Anyway, I can't wait till I can have a personal AI to give me advice like this. <laughs> right. Um. And I think this is really poetic that the um human needs help from the not human to work through human interactions. Um, I don't necessarily think this is a symptom of Colin's changing in nature. Um, I just think this is something that Colin was never good at to begin with. Um, but as we see Colin become more machine, is Dragon maybe become, becoming more human? Um, food for thought, at least. Yeah, totally. The sheriff asks for some reassurance that Defiant will be able to learn something that will help catch the Nine. And he begins breaking down the crime scene in a way that reveals a lot about the group's current psychology. He finds that Hope Wolf tortured one of the stronger, more warrior-like deputies to death and reasons that this is a sign that Jack is grooming Hook Wolf to be more of a cutthroat, someone who rejoices in cruelty and less of the pseudo-honorable warrior we had seen previously. Oh, oh good. <laughs> what, is, <laughs> what is really... Uh, interesting about the slaughterhouse nine is they recruit where they recruit recruit you by playing into your wants and desires um that's how they get you but then they immediately try to strip you of those character defining attributes as soon as they've got you um they like every part of them is monstrous like every little part of them like yeah but they manipulate you and then destroy the thing that made you you like it's so terrible like even asshole terrible people like hook wolf like he had a code at least and now they want to rip him of that yeah right like the, the only even marginally like respectable part of his character is is being taken away yeah so yeah uh, colin heads back to the dragon ship and uther uh dragon is worried about him worried to see signs of darkness in him that he tries to get uh especially when he tries to get inside the heads of the nine 
yeah, this is one of those moments where I really, uh, it really started bringing me towards Dragon's side and be a little less concerned about her uh, as a character. Um, she's yes, she's into Colin, who's morally dubious at, at best, um, but she does also seem like genuinely interested in his well-being. Um, part of the relationship is that like she feels only she can truly watch him, and 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 she has this responsibility to ensure that she's not that he's not going too far. And it's this really kind of sweet moment where she seems worried about him. Yeah, totally. I agree that it that it comes off as genuine. Uh, they also mourn the loss of two of the other dragon suits, uh, the, uh, of the two dragon suits that they sent to fight the Undersiders. Uh, dragon is aware that her AI were outsmarted, and it's because she's still largely constrained from making them. Uh, Colin just gave her a few little workarounds, actually. Yeah, and this goes a long way toward explaining uh, the battle that I didn't really like. I just don't know if this kind of retroactive retroactive explanation works to get through what i still think is kind of a clunky action scene um but i don't know um there's there's one weird beat that i wanted to pull out here um when colin finds out the suits are dead he yells fuck and then he worries about dragon getting mad about it (laughs) has it been established the dragon doesn't like swearing either did i miss that are we supposed to be thinking about bone saw this (laughs) moment it's just very strange yeah i'm pretty sure she's she's sworn before and then she even says like no it's okay i swore i mean if anything i think it's just like maybe he's he's trying to go out of his way not to act crazy yeah i guess so. i i, I don't know yeah it, it i i noticed it I, I definitely like noticed what you're talking about but but i was just like well he's an awkward guy so so i'll write off prepared to write off some things to just uh <laughs> call him being Colin. that's fair that's fair uh yeah so uh as he works on fixing his leg, he thinks about how the basis of his work is e- efficiency, as he puts it. So, like, Taylor has described it before as, as like, uh, c- c- compacting things or making things very um, uh, fitting and, you know, cramming a lot of stuff into a small space. Um, but, but Colin is more characterizing it as, like, making the waste from one thing serve as the fuel for another and, and just conserving everything about the system optimally. So, so it's, it's, uh, the, the consequence of that tends to be that, that you can make things really compact, but that's not, that's not how he views his power. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and, and he relates this actually with how he's able to handle and even enjoy the intensity, the like panopticon like nature of his romance with dragon. Yeah, and I like how you see in kind of their conversations that they both enjoy it too. Like Dragon's kind of her sheepishness when she admits that she knows things, like that she saw things about him, um, how he smiles at some of these things. And I think it, it says something with it when an AI and a cyborg have a more believable and real relationship than Taylor and Brian do. Um, oh, yeah. There's something I really enjoy this relationship between the two of them. Um, it feels very real um, and, and it's it's very well done. Yeah, I mean, now that you point that out, I almost feel like that has to be an intentional contrast where like for for, for like as weird as this relationship is, these these are a couple of adults. I'm going to put a question back there. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you can I call that, Dragon. I think that's fair. But, yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, he finishes designing his new self modifications to his leg. Um, and moves to looking at Dragon's code. And they talk about uh, playing 10 by 10, which is a game where they calibrate each other's bodies, Scott. Not everyone's having sex in this arc. Yeah, I guess that's the theme. <laughs> so yeah, um, it's it, it's a bit alarming uh, that he thinks. There were also the inbringers to consider. He'd gone too far in Brockton Bay, but the fundamental principle was right. They had to be stopped, if it was even possible, and he wouldn't complain if it was him who did the deed. If it was a question of going all out, holding nothing back, showing no compunctions, and finally stopping the abominations, well, he'd do it all over again. So, he hasn't learned a damn thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, he, 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 yeah. Go ahead. He, he does seem to have, like, grown and, like, mellowed, maybe, in some ways. Um... They talk about the Undersiders, and he admits that he made mistakes in his judgment of Skitter specifically. Yeah, I don't know if I'd fully say that he hasn't learned anything. I think he clearly has regret here, um, but regret just by itself is kind of useless. 
uh, we've ha- we've kind of noticed a theme of where of people realizing that they're doing something wrong, but then choosing to double down on it anyway. Uh, Taylor does it. Amy does it. Uh, Colin does it as well. Um, he feels bad about what he did, but still thinks it's the right thing to do. And I don't know if I'd call that growth, but it's something. Yeah. 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 I'm. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, I, I think we're supposed to. I think you're supposed to feel cautiously optimistic about Colin's character. I think. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. so Colin makes a discovery as he digs through Dragon's code. She doesn't just function as a tinker, but she is a tinker in some sense. There's evidence that she actually had a trigger event, something radically changed and improved her code in order to let her do what she does. That's crazy and kind of completely game changing because now powers and passengers or whatever they are um, might not be related to organic type matter at all that as long as something has a sufficient level of intelligence it can get a passenger which is i don't even know what to make of that yeah cool yeah so uh, the two of them realize they could potentially learn a lot about the nature of trigger events by digging through dragon's code in, in a way that you can't really dig through a brain um, but Dragon stops him and tells him they'll need to explore this under the radar because she thinks the PRT already has the answers they're looking for and says if they survive the day to ask her about Cauldron. So Dragon knows about Cauldron. That's the big reveal that ends this interlude. Um, yeah. I wonder how much she knows. It is kind of it does kind of say something when Dragon seems generally worried about Cauldron. Um, Dragon, who's very powerful and basically is the most important member of the PRT's work. She is the key to their success in a lot of places. Um, so this is raising stakes related to Cauldron and their plan and what they want. Um, it's going to be really interesting. And it kind of is a point for Dragon is good um, in that column uh, since they're against Cauldron, which very much seems like not a good organization. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, it's something we don't talk about at all i don't think but but like the prt really really relies on like dragons specifically d- dragons technology like i think um i believe that like the containment foam is like a dragon thing it is like, yeah i think yeah yeah so so that's i mean in, you, that that's everywhere that's that's used all the time so not as much as it should be <laughs> Yeah, but do you remember when Lady had to have very special certification and licensing to carry the film sprayer, Scott? Yeah, but just have everyone go through the that? class. Well, just like Emma right. went to the the. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that that wraps up our beat by beat discussion of the first part of Arc Sixteen Monarch. Um, so why don't we Why don't we move into those speculations there, Scott? All right, everyone's favorite section. Um, once again, Matt, no new, no uh, old speculations that were confirmed or not confirmed. Um, we got a little hint towards something that might back up my Lisa speculation, but um, nothing confirmed. So we we can't close down any of the old ones. I do have some new ones, though, um, one of which we've already talked about. My first one is that Sierra is going to quit working for Taylor at some point, and Taylor um, will not take it well characteristically will not do well with that information um i don't want to speculate on what she's going to do um i'm sure she'll let her go but it's going to be hard for her um my second one is uh is that uh nilbog will be recruited by the slaughterhouse nine i think we're we're kind of setting that up we, we established that the slaughterhouse nine are desperately recruiting he seems like someone they certainly would love to have on their team um i don't know how that's going to happen i don't know how they get to him without him just going crazy and trying to kill them all but that seems like something we're setting up for the future so awesome and that's all i got all right that's it for this week again a quick reminder uh, for all the artists out there if you're an artist or a person who owns a pencil uh, click that link in the description for details on the first we've got worm fan art contest we will see you all next week when we wrap up arc 16 Bye-bye. Okay. I'm okay, probably going to cut that when my voice cracked as I said okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, that sounded intentional to me. So oh, now okay. I'm just, just going to read this.
this part now and then this can go like at the end i guess yeah um yeah 